pursuant to provisions of 2.68030 of the Metropolitan Code of Laws, please take notice that decisions of the Metropolitan Government of Nashville and Davidson County Community Oversight Board may be appealed to the Chancery Court of Davidson County for review under a common law writ of certiorari. An appeal must be fulfilled, must be filed within 60 days at the entry of the final decision by the board. Any person or other entity the minutes uh, be approved. Is there any further discussion? All in favor of approving the minutes say aye. 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 Opposed say no. The motion to approve the minutes passes. And now I will start with my uh, chair remarks. First uh, item is a letter to, to uh, Mayor Cooper. As requested by the board, I wrote a letter to Mayor Cooper asking for an explanation as to why only four of the nine additional staffing positions asked for in the COB budget were appropriated in his proposal. We received a reply from Mr. John Bunton, the Director of Community Safety with the Mayor's Office. The response indicated that the COB's success is vital to Nashville's success, and that the mayor is a strong supporter of the COB. I appreciate Mr. Bunton taking the time to reply to our requests and providing detailed justification for the four positions that were included in the mayor's budget. Mr. Bunton's letter, however, neglected to directly provide reasoning as to why the other positions, including a social worker, executive assistant, and legal advisor, our legal assistant, were not included. And next is the, an over, the overall uh, discussion about the budget. In spite of our best efforts to advocate for the needed community oversight board staff positions, we only received five of the nine positions needed to fulfill, to fulfill what is required of the COB and the Metro Charter. During the budget process, we were optimistic that we would be awarded the positions needed. But that hope began to wane with, two, with the two elephants in the room during the budget cycle. The most obvious and most publicized was the $22.6 million MMPS revenue shortage that was introduced by Governor Lee's new school funding formula. Couple this with the expenditures and the mayor's budget remaining basically unchanged by the council. These restrictions made the budget process much more difficult but not impossible. In my opinion, the mayor's equity pro promise fell short for the community oversight board. Because, this, because of this, the, the COB will continue to operate below the penny standard for every dollar that MMPD receives. Have to manage a high, the high probability of a slower response time in citizen complaints. Continue to lack the resources to speak to related family victims of trauma. Continue to operate without a needed management structure. Even when having to make bricks out of straw, so to speak, my hope is that the MNCO staff continues to serve the community in a high quality and professional manner. Even though we didn't get all the positions needed, we are appreciative of the five positions appropriated by the mayor and the council. And the dialogue and the efforts of the budget chair, Chair Allen, Vice Chair Suara, and member at large, Mendez and also the finance department. 
And next is the executive director's performance evaluation. A draft of the director, Director Fritcher's performance evaluation has been prepared and is being revised and rated by the executive committee members. Once this process is completed, we will submit a report to the entire board. Nominating committee. During the previous board meeting, Mr. Abdullah, Dr. Hildreth, and Mr. Holloway were appointed to the nominating committee. Since the last meeting, Dr. Hildreth graciously agreed to serve as the chair. During the executive committee meeting, in addition, uh, during the executive committee meeting, in addition to the going through the process of, of fulfilling the 2023 officers, they were also asked to address the upcoming August chair vacancy. And that's the end of my chair remarks. Next on the agenda is the executive director's report. Director Fitcher, you have the floor. All right, good evening. <clears throat> I'm gonna go through this. Um, there's a lot of information in here. Um, if you wanna hold your questions to the end, that would probably be the best route for us to go. Um, we're working with HR to get the results of the Research Analyst 2 position. It's been reposted because we didn't have a lot of um, applicants. And so it'll be posted for one more week and then we will move forward with making a selection for the uh, Research Analyst 2 position. We had, of course, you heard Mr. Um, Hayes bring up, we had an executive and nomination committee that met, they met on June 15th. There were three executive committee members and three nominations committee members present and also staff members were present. We have continued to do training every month. I encourage our department to find trainings, webinars, um, and share that with the staff. And so we attended a NACO webinar training entitled Understanding Brady, Brady and Gigolo, Civilian Oversight's Role. Um, we attended training with the Nashville Conflict Resolution Center um, regarding mediation. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's really, still in the works. Um, I thought it was important that we meet with the NCRC so that we make certain that as we are referring people to mediation that um, they're able to, number one, meet the need, and then number two, just getting some tips on how to encourage people to take up mediation. Um, some people are, um, really shy away from it because they don't really understand what NCRC offers, and so we had that meeting. Um, I've been in touch with the um, Sarah who runs NCRC. Um, she said that there is some grants um, available and maybe we can do some collaboration, so I'm waiting to hear back from her in regards to that. Myself and Investigator Williams received our certificates from NACO um, and we are now certified practitioners of oversight. Um, it's a three-year certification. We have to, it, it expires December 31st, 2024. So if we want to continue to keep that up, you have to take um, continuing education courses. Um, I attended multiple meetings in the, I've been had a very busy June. Um, in the month of June, um, some collaboration with the Salt Wagon Clinic, they wanted to do something um, in regards to juveniles and traffic stops. Um, and so Daniel's gonna lead that and be the lead on that with our community liaison. Um, that's through Meharry Medical College. Um, I met with the Metro Director of Public Property, Mr. Abe Westcott. He's a new um, employee of Metro. Um, I was just kind of sh showing him around um, our facility, um, also the building in general. Um, and so he, um, w he, I guess, had knowledge that we were looking for a new space and we wanted to be on the list um, if they started having property uh, available. I know there's other departments that are looking as well. Um, and so it would be nice um, if they had a location for us. Um, I think that even with having parking, um, there are some other, having living, I say living, but being in a historical building, um, it comes with its own host of problems. Um, you know, whether it be, uh, well, I'm not gonna get into issues, but it has its own host of problems. And so um, that is something that he is has been made aware of. I met with the Justice Integration Systems, um, the chair the, in um, the JIS ED and the mayor's office. Um, the mayor's office, uh, I guess there was this, there, need, there needed to be a conversation um, because they wanted 
wanted to know why, number one, we wanted to move over to the JIS network. Um, they also wanted to try to meet whatever uh, needs that we have that maybe they think that we are, they're not being met. Or So it was a long conversation um, with, the, with um, Kristen Wilson, um, Judge Mondelli, and Miss Natalie Steers. And so we're scheduled to have a assessment um, of our office tomorrow um, with Keith Durbin's team. And then um, once that is done, that report will go back to JIS, and then JIS will make a determination and vote on whether or not they can um, help us um, with our platform. Um, I think one of the things is Metro ITS has said that they cannot really host the civil platform, which is our new um, case management system that we're interested in. Um, so that would be uh, something that JIS said they could facilitate. And so I think they just want to have an assessment and see where we are, what, it, what our needs are, and then share that information with JIS. That's my understanding of the meeting. Um, we've talked about the budget discussions. Um, I've been meeting with Metro to get some things, like we, we had some issues with timekeeping, those types of things. Um, and so that's basically it on that. We've done a lot of community outreach this month um, when Ms. Robinson, who's not here, um, but when she came, uh, she, when she got, she came on board, I wanna say May 23rd or 24th. Um, and then she's just been hitting the ground running. We've had multiple uh, just, I've been extremely busy with that and getting her acclimated to her new role. Um, she came from Metro School, so she's pretty familiar with the city, but all of the things that she had listed, you know, has been um, just a, a lot of things. And so you can see some of the things that we've done over the past four weeks. We've t attended multiple um, community, engage I mean, community events. Um, and we've spent the entire weekend on participating in Juneteenth celebrations. Um, we're also gonna attend the National Pride Fest on Saturday and Sunday with colla in collaboration with um, the NAACP. And um, yeah, and she's just been meeting with other community partners and trying to get her you know, feet wet and also get to know what their needs are and doing some assessments and things of that nature. Um, you can see what the legal resources, um, Mr. Ewan has been working um, with trying to get us a, well, we do have an appointment now with the TBI in regards to the MOU, and I'll get into that a little bit more, um, with Metro Development and Housing Authority, Parks, the Clerk's Office, as well as Vanderbilt. I, if you can recall last August, I think it was, um, I met with um, the chief of staff or chief of police, they have a different name for the chief of police over at Vanderbilt. Um, and we had talked about getting an MOU with Vanderbilt and that kind of just slipped through the cracks. We haven't followed up on it. I, I take responsibility for that. Um, and so I think that it's, some, so I've had him reach out to determine when we could set up a meeting with them to just determine what's going on over there. Um, we do know that they have a MOU with Metro Police Department. <clears throat> and I also received a couple of calls from, um, from individuals in the community who thought that, you know, we had talked about this and they brought it back up. I thought it was pretty interesting um, that that was another call that I received recently. Um, so we will get um, more information and then I'll let you know. We do have a meeting with the TBI scheduled, and I forgot to add that to my report. I think it's scheduled for the second week of July to discuss the MOU. I think it would be good for uh, the MOU team, whoever's on our MOU committee, um, once we get that information, um, what they want. We have the old TBI uh, draft that they gave us initially, and I thought it might be good to share that with the MOU nomination, nominating committee, or, or task force, I'm sorry, the MOU task force, and, this, and, and then that would, I think, be helpful so that if we need to look at what we need to bring to the table at TBI, it would be helpful. Um, um, Gavin Williamson, Crowell Williamson, our research analyst, um, he's been working really diligently on the use of force report. Um, also, we had discussed a body-worn camera audit, um, as well as doing some other things. Um, one of the things that he has been doing pretty um, regularly is working with the um, SAMHSA gangs and the PIC, which is you know the partners in care. Um, so he is the person that is going to the meetings and getting information in regards to um, the collaboration between MMPD and it, Mental Health Co-op. 
Um, investigations, um, we had three investigative complaints since the last board meeting in May. Um, we've received 12 non-complaint contact calls for service. And I made a correction to this report. We, were, we had three dispositions issued this month, in the month of June. And Gavin will talk about those in a little while. Um, two cases have been referred for mediation. Um, and we've had five requests for records. Um, and we had no issues with getting those records. I'll be going over proposed resolution 2021-005. Uh, so I want to move on to the police shooting that occurred on Thursday, June the 2nd. Um, it happened at 8.39 p.m. Um, I was alerted of a police shooting and made contact with Commander Lara to get more information. Um, I made contact with my investigative staff. I headed to the scene. Um, this, it, the shooting occurred at 701 Division Street, which was the location of Frugal McDougal's. I was briefed by Commander Lara, um, but he could only provide me a brief update because he had just, it had just happened. So his information was come slowly coming in. He also wasn't there at that time. So once he got on the scene, um, you know, he gave me more information. When I, when I arrived on the scene, I was briefed by Captain Brian Anderson. He is over the CID division. I was told that the store, the store security guard was deceased. He was killed by an unknown black male who retreated into the beverage store and three MMPD officers went into the store to make contact with him. I was told that an unknown black male had a firearm and that two of the three officers and an unknown black male had fired their weapons. The unknown black male was shot, injured, and taken by ambulance to the hospital. I was told that um, myself and the two MNC investigators were not briefed by the TBI agent in charge, and I really just um, chalked that up as possibly due to the circumstances of the incident because it was a peculiar incident. There was a homicide as well as a shooting, two different um, areas where that occurred. Um, and there were many witnesses who were um, patrons of the store. So it was a little... I, it was a lot of stuff happening, and so to protect the um, integrity of the um, of the uh, the crime scenes, I just waited um, to until they could brief me again. Um, um, I asked Commander Lara to pass along a message that I wanted to view the inside of the store where the shooting took place because that is something that we normally are able to see. And since this was inside of a building, we did not know exactly what had happened. Um, I. I, of course, was not allowed to do that, um, and I'll get to that in a minute, um, which was fine. Um, we then went down to the body-worn camera. Uh, I'm sorry, we were told that we could view the body-worn camera footage at MMPD headquarters. We headed there. We were able to view it. There was a TBI agent um, president, Captain Blaine White, had showed us what he had available. The following morning, I got a contact from uh, a call from Commander Lara um, and told me it was early in the morning that we could meet him or meet the TBI agent and um, commander, I'm sorry, Captain Brian Anderson at the Frugal McDougal's. And so we did that, went to Frugal McDougal's, probably got there at 9 a.m. Um, and the agent in charge walked us around the outside scene, gave us an update on the briefing, which was slightly different than what we was told um, from the night before, and then um, led us inside and showed us um, the entire scene and walked around um, where, because they had finished their investigation or whatever they were trying to collect. So um, we had a pretty good view of all that occurred there. Um, and then uh, we that was the end of that. Um, I do, of course, with this being a, a, a peculiar situation where there is a homicide involved as well as a shooting, um, it is an ongoing criminal investigation open at this point. Um, and so um, we are waiting until they have finished what they have to do before we um, begin to um, investigate this. But I did want you to know that it, it, it will be a part of our reporting because I am, of course, opening up a director-initiated investigation. Investigation. During that time, um, as I move into the MOU, I was informed at the scene that there was an, a new MOU um, between the police department, the TBI, and the district attorney general's office. I was not aware of that. Um, and so I had lots of questions. When did that happen? Are you sure it's a new one? Because I haven't been told about it. Um, and so the next day when I got to work, I asked um, attorney 
Attorney Yoon to locate that MOU. Um, and at first he could not find it. Um, it wasn't posted anywhere. Um, and so he finally, well, I guess, reached out to Metro Legal or whomever, and he was able to get a copy of it. And um, it was signed on May the 23rd. Um, and because I was not made aware that there was this new MOU agreement between the three agencies, and after reading it and reviewing it, which I did send to you all, um, there was language in there that um, gave OPA um, a, some, some it, there was language that included the OPA, I'll just say that, that I felt like it should have also been something that we should have been a part of. Um, and I mean, I'm not necessarily saying that they um, had to include us, but because we are a part of this process, it would have been nice to even know that they were um, updating their existing MOU because the last MOU that they had um, was signed, and I looked today, it was signed in 2017, um, and it was between um, the previous TBI director, the previous chief of police, and, um, and then the, the district attorney general. Um, and I think that that was signed after Jacquees Clemens was killed. And so even though they have updated their um, MOU, I still felt that the the exclusion of our voice in that um, was problematic. So I wanted to bring that to your attention. Um, I went to a forest review. Um, I had, a, there was a forest review hearing since our last meeting, it was on May the 26th. We were supposed to have one tomorrow, but that one's been canceled. Um, and we can talk about that if you want to. Um, so I wanted to move on to this um, recruitment event that, um, that myself and um, Ms. Robinson was invited to. It occurred on June the 4th. I was invited by Lieutenant Michael Vaughn, who is, I guess, the he works in recruiting, um, and it was over at the Training Academy. It was really a nice setup. They had all the different divisions at the Training Academy, um, from the helicopters, from the, you know, the horses, excuse me, in different branches as you walked, as you went in, you walked around, they had the canine out there. One of the things that caught me by surprise was when I walked by the gang units table. And as I walked by that table, I noticed that there was a picture, um, there was a, there was different like gang paraphernalia, like hats and maybe a bandana and some other things that I'm pretty familiar with. Other people may not have been familiar with it. Um, there was some cannabis in a container, which I thought was interesting. Um, but one of the things that I felt was really um was uh, so basically what I wrote was what caught my attention was a single white t-shirt with seven black men airbrushed on the front of the shirt with what appeared to be single nicknames or aliases under each photo. Um, one of the photos had two names which appeared to be a first and what I would say was a last name. Um, so it had a nickname and a last name, um, a last name that is pretty familiar in this city. Um, it said the last name attached to the photo was a well-recognized last name of the Nashville community. Um, I felt that the photo was distasteful. Um, it exuded racial overtones and overall was inappropriate um, for use of a photo display at a recruiting event. Um, I sent an email to the recruiting host, which was Lieutenant Michael Vaughn, commander of, and the commander of recruitment, David Newburn. I sent it to Carlos Lara, the commander of community outreach, and also the chief, um, asking for answers why the picture was used and what they were going to do to take action to make some corrective changes change there. Um, and so I heard back from them on yesterday, and I will let you know what they said. Um, basically, um, they thanked me for attending the event, asked that we would be um, participating in future events, um, and that after looking into the issue, they had decided that all displays at recruitment events would have to be approved prior to the event. Um, as the recruitment unit, they're working on a checklist that they will utilize to ensure that no offensive or provocative content is displayed and that officers staffing the displays are properly attired. I would like to encourage you to provide feedback on what we can add to this checklist to ensure that we do not offend anyone or any at any of our events. 
um, because this is, of course, counterintuitive to our goal of attracting people who, of a diverse group of people um, to join the police department. Um, he went on to say he didn't believe that anyone intended for the content to be offensive, but he understood my point of view regarding this, the display. Um, he said, for future recruitment events, participation from the Specialized Investigations Division will be limited to NIBN, which is the National Integrated Ballist Ballistics Information Network Unit and the Neighborhood Safety Unit, and they would work very closely with the Public Health Department and other nonprofits to address the opiate epidemic and overdose overdose deaths in Davidson County. Um, and so, I mean, I think that there is a way to, I appreciated that, but I also feel like there is a way to display all the different units that the police department offers, because I think that those are things that people are interested in. It just has to be done in a proper way that isn't um, offensive to people. So I, I, I don't mind working with them on that. So, um, that, I think that kind of concludes, let me see something, hold on one second. Um, yeah, that concludes my, that concludes my, that concludes the uh, director's report and I'll take any questions. Are there any questions for, thank you, first of all, thank you for that thorough report. Uh, are there any questions or comments for uh, Executive Director Fitcher? Mr. Gwynn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, the, the first thing I noticed when I read the MOU uh, with the TBI was the absence of the COB. I hope, I hope it was just an oversight um, and maybe just something held over from the last director and the last chief, but I'd like to volunteer to work on the MOU committee. This, that's the kind of work that I do regularly. Um, that's for the yeah. chair as well. Uh, if, if granted, yeah, thank you. Um, the other thing too, I wanted to ask about. Um, and I think it came up in one of the letters. I think it was the chief's response to the Chapman Brainer response. Is that right? Am I saying that right? Yeah, we haven't gotten to that part of the. Um, Sorry. Yeah, we're going to get to that in a second. Is okay. that part of your? Oh no. Okay. Okay. So hold on one second, Mr. Wynn. I. It's not specifically about the case. It's just something that I, I noticed and it's sort of a reoccurring issue for, for me. And I just wanted to ask you a question about it. Yeah, let me go back over that. Um, so the chief responded to multiple PRs um, and that's oh, missing out of my report. So um, hold on one second. We received three letters or responses from the chief of police. Let me get to them. Um, on June 13th, of course, we received one. On the 15th and the 16th. Are you referring to the one, um, was it 2021-043? It, it's the one. It's one where the chief responded that the, the officers do get implicit and explicit bias mm -hmm. training. Yeah, that is, yeah, so that is, uh, yes, 2021-043. Um, and it says, finally, I note that the board amended the director's findings by adding a requirement for implicit bias training. I note, however, that there was no finding by the COB that Officer Chapman's actions were the result of bias. Mm -hmm. Further, OPA reviewed random videos of this officer's interactions with citizens and couldn't find no indication that he acts in a biased manner. Finally, all officers receive implicit bias training. I find no reason to require additional training on this subject for Officer Chapman. For the officer, this is now public a public record, sir. Yeah. Well, the, the question I have for you and, and, the, and the chair as well is, um, if anybody's anti-bias oversight, this is what this board is about, and a lot of other things, but to check bias, whether it's implicit or explicit, um, I, I would, as a board member, like to see the curriculum mm -hmm. and the lesson plan, or. Um, the department allowing some of the board members to audit the next biased training that they, pre that they present at the academy. 
Well, you know, when you brought, I think it was the last meeting right. where we had this, and it was the meeting in April mm -hmm. that um, Ms. Spencer brought up and you um, bias, and you brought, you gave us, you sent us a pamphlet from IACP, the International Chiefs of Police, uh, Association of Chiefs of Police, and I sent that on um, and talked about that, and so I don't think it was something that, um, I haven't heard back about it, okay. could it like that. Obviously, from my opinion, um, that there, you know, either there's implicit or explicit bias when I went to a recruiting event where you're trying to recruit black and brown people and diversify the police department and you have a t-shirt displaying people as if it was some type of um, six pack. Um, I just find that you know whatever they have is is not is not um, adequate in my opinion. So, yeah, I would welcome that. Mr. Milner, I, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I just want to take a moment uh, as a member of this board and as a black man to thank you for having the courage to recognize that bias. Uh, that was rather explicit uh, in that display. We always talk about changing the narrative, taking control of the conversation, and these kinds of things constantly set us back. So I, I do want to say thank you. And I, for one, along with the rest of the board, probably saw the photograph. And when you saw the photograph, as soon as they realized that a picture was being taken, they demurred. They basically faded away in the background because whether they understood it initially, I think they understood it then. And I, I just wanna say I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Judge Brown. Yeah. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, on the um, incident with the photograph, something that kind of struck me, uh, looking at the, this is a recruitment for minorities and such, but all of the, f the four officers in the background are all white males. It would seem like in a recruitment thing, uh, the people uh, actually there, uh, apart from, and I agree with you about the, the shirt, but it, it does, it struck me that all four of them were black, uh, white males. And I think that again is just something that we have to look at for, um, not a deliberate act, but but certainly implicit. Uh, the other question I had is on a different topic. Um, I've sort of pushed on six-month report on cases pending more than six months. I thought we were going to get a list of cases pending more than six months, and I, I don't see a, a list. We get a, a long list of, uh, of cases, but it's pretty hard to sort out. So I thought we were going to get a, a separate list that just listed those that have been pending more than six months. Isn't that in your aging report that I sent, where it says investigation aging report? It's dated June 15th. Okay. Did you get uh, that? Maybe I missed it. I'll give you this one. You can have mine. Okay. It, it's printed off, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't see it. I didn't see it in the... I didn't see it, so if I missed it, uh, that's my fault. But. Okay. Yeah. reports and such, but it, yeah. it, it's hard to, you can't pull it out of the tracking report. Right, itself. and this one actually has a little chart, a colored chart, so less than 60 days, 61 days to six months, and then over six months. So I'll hand this to you. All right, I was just looking for something that was specific, gotcha. just a specific list of six months. Okay, thank yeah. you. No problem. Uh, I think Mr. Holloway was next, and then Mr. Milner. Uh, on, uh, back to the recruitment, um, you have to use people that look like the people that you're trying to recruit. Uh, when I was recruited, they used uh, people of color in, in the area that they was trying to recruit. You is seldom that you can recruit people when you when you're not doing that because. Uh, they don't know how to take you. They don't know whether you tell them the truth or what. But if you got somebody that looked like you, you have a tendency to believe them more so than 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 not. 
um, my thing is um, who is in charge? Who's over the oh, who's the commander in charge of that bureau? Uh, I would like to see him at the next meeting. And if he tell you he can't come because he's on vacation, tell him give us a date when he can come. And so he can kind of give us a layout where he can improve the recruitment process. Okay. Okay, Mr. Milner. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, on a totally different subject. Uh, uh, the uh, HR portion of the report, Madam Director, uh, I note that there is, we did get some relief as far as legal assistance is concerned in the budget. Is that correct? Although it's someone who is going to work out of Metro Legal's office? Is this now the time to discuss that? Yeah, we can because discuss that. Because I have that. questions. Yeah, yeah. So... What, what is the reporting matrix on that? Yeah, I, I, I just had that conversation. And how does that work? How does that work? Um, so... When I saw that in the amended budget, I wasn't really clear what it was because it wasn't something that m myself and anyone from Metro Legal had a discussion about. So I'm not really familiar with what that person, it really has nothing to do with us. Like Metro Legal has their own people and they staff up every department. So to kind of include it in the language of our budget ask was a little puzzling to me. I wasn't really sure what it meant. Um, but I do know that Metro Legal, of course, is requesting more support um, staff members or staff attorneys. So I get that. But they don't necessarily coincide. Our, bus, our budget asks, a, a person that works in Metro Legal will never be able, they don't work for us. They're, they're, the budget, whatever funding, it doesn't come from us. So to have them to kind of exclusively um, together doesn't really really make sense to me. Um, so I have no idea what that position is, except for what it what normally, like Mr. Um, Dickerson is here, what a normal um, COB person that is assigned would be doing. You and if I can add, that a little? If, <laughs> I, I just like to add, add to that, that that was something that I really thought was out of place, and I, I started to mention it in my report, but I said, okay, don't, don't sweat the small stuff here. Uh, but uh, my understanding is, and, and to use Dr. Hildreth's example of, we had a four-lane highway. We're getting more investigators. It's going to become a six-lane highway, and we're going to go to this one-lane bridge. And that's still going to be there. Regardless of whether we get this person, uh, the person in, in uh, Metro Legal, that's still going to be there. So I thought that was so out of place to just go to another department. And even though there may have been some things that they're going to do to assist the COB, but it's it's not directly what we we needed. And and I I just thought that was just kind of out of place. Yeah, because we when we sent the just so that you have an understanding, when we sent the budget to the to the mayor's office with the equity tool and everything that they asked for, we prioritized the positions and how they would flow in our office. Not necessarily thinking we would get all nine, hopeful that we would get them, but because we had it prioritized, investigators, legal assistant, case, uh, I'm sorry, social worker, you know, and so on. Um, so when they stepped out of how that priority looked, um, and so, of course, having investigators is important, but like I explained to the chair of the, um, you know, council member um, Allen, that it doesn't, without a legal assistant, and increasing the investigative staff, it does not take us out of the backlog. Right. Right. Because now whoever is going to be, so now who our legal person is gonna have double time, double work. Because so now we have uh, five investigators opposed to three. Um, and so they didn't have any um, kind of like residual funding in there for, um, us to even try to move funding, you know, funds around. Um, when we got this amended position, I looked very clo closely at what the salary was, um, and that. So when you see that seventy-four thousand five hundred, remember that is with fringe benefits. That is not the base salary. So I had to look where they fit that in. And those two positions that could even fit in that administrative role would be either that I have to choose between a social worker and an executive assistant. You know, so that's how that worked. 
Mr. Milner. Yeah, but however, Mr. Chair, the language seemed quite generous to me. Uh, the language read such that uh, the Metro Legal Department is going to dedicate a full-time equivalent legal person to serve solely and expressly for the purposes of the community oversight staff. And I, I, I didn't see anything contrary to that. And my only question was, what do we need to do to make sure that it reports directly to the director's office? I, I don't know if that's, there's that's anything the that we, right. we... That sounds fair to me. That would be great. It does, but I don't know. I mean, with the budget passing, I don't know if... I thought that's what it, I'm sorry with the budget with the budget passing, but but yeah, that was concerning to me because uh, I won't mention all of them, but that was one of the responses in the the response from the mayor's office. It was there, it was in the uh, the substitute budget language. It was there, and and I had actually and actually uh, Director Fitcher and myself, we had already found that 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 was one item that they were saying for the COB even before this topic even came up, but. Uh, but no, that's uh, it was it was it was concerning. Um, um, can you you want to have an uh, opportunity to kind of? I know you don't know I'll, much about it. I'll but. just say that I speak for neither the mayor's office nor the director of law. But um, obviously, whatever is budgeted, you know, that, that wasn't part of the legal department's mm -hmm. request. That's a separate request. But we're always willing to reach out and be helpful to the best of our ability to help out the department. I know that it's different having an in-house legal advisor, um, but I will say that the charter assigns role for all legal representation for all departments, boards, and commissions to the Department of Law. So I think that we're, we are, we just, our department is looking at the approved budget from last night in the same way that everyone is. We're, we're working through it. Um, we're making some, I know that our department is looking at some, some changes ourselves. And so I anticipate that we'll have an answer as to how that position will assist COB shortly. And we'll mm -hmm. work very closely with legal advisor Yoon and director Fitcher to make sure that we are giving you all the representation that the budget requires. Mm -hmm. Am I to, I'm sorry, am I to understand or, or, or can you communicate to us whether or not that, that's a full-time equivalent that's being dedicated as uh, opposed uh, uh, consistent with the language that kind of was a part of this thing? Um, I, I don't have the language in front of me. I, rem I, I thought I remembered the language stating that it was um, dedicated to COB partially, but that it would also staff other departments. I, oh, I may I, be incorrect I, I about I, that. I, I think you're correct on that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, all right, uh, moving on. Okay, the next item on the, on the agenda is uh, the semi-annual evaluation of MMPD implementation of COB policy recommendation, and that's it, Mr. Carl Williamson. You have the floor. Mr. Chair, and good evening, board. Um, I know I've talked at you a lot the past few months, so I'll try to make this as brief as I can while still being informative. Um, we're going to be discussing a report that I put together. Uh, it was on your chairs when you walked in. Looks like this has this colorful cover. And it's an evaluation, effectively, of what MNPD has done with the various policy recommendations that we have made as a body uh, since our inception. Next slide. Just briefly on the impetus for this report, it's effectively an extension uh, or a continued effort at transparency of MMPD's responsiveness to our work. Uh, over the last few months, I spoke about investigative findings and what we do as a body when MMPD disagrees with those investigative findings. And uh, just a brief foray into that, uh, per Director Fitchard's uh, mention earlier that we did receive three responses from the chief last week. Uh, those were generally, uh, well, the main takeaway from those new dispositions is that our agreement rates with MMPD have increased as they pertain to investigative findings. Um, that has bumped our agreement with the department overall up to 74%. Um, it was in the high 60s previously, and it has bumped uh, our, their agreement with our investigative findings pertaining to sustained or deficiency identified findings up from 6% now up to 19. Um, that's obviously the direction that we wanted to go. And I, I mentioned earlier uh, that that low number was in part due to a low sample size. So part of this is normalizing, part of it 
may be from the policy advisory report. It's kind of too early to tell, but um, as we continue to get these dispositions, I will continue to update the board, but numbers are trending in the right direction, uh, granted still from a small sample size. Um, so that was sort of our attempt at transparency last month, and this is complementary to that. So last month we discussed investigative findings, this month I'll discuss policy findings. Uh, this report doesn't discuss any recommendations, it's purely factual. Um, so yeah, this, this does not need a board vote, this is just me analyzing whether or not MMPD has implemented our policies and to what extent. Um, this style of report is pretty frequently used by city auditors to track the status of their recommendations. Um, if you bump to the next slide, you can see, this is just an example of what the Austin auditor did and was sort of a model for what we are doing here. They uh, audited the Austin Police Department's handling of complaints and they, as you can see on these two pages, monitored their recommendations, whether they were implemented, whether they were underway, or they were not tested, and this is just the auditing department attempting to do uh, their due diligence into whether their recommendations are being followed, which is similar to what I'm trying to do here. Uh, I recommend that this report be semi-annual. Um, we only release policy advisory reports maybe two, three, four times a year, so reproducing it monthly I don't think would add all that much information, um, so we can discuss what that looks like, but I recommend it be semi-annual. Next slide. So as I already mentioned, this report gauges which policy recommendations of the board have, have been implemented by MNPD, which have been partially adopted and which have not been adopted. They're color coded, as you can see in this chart to the right. And just a note per the memorandum of understanding between us and MNPD, upon receipt of a policy advisory report, the chief has 45 days, 45 calendar days to respond to each recommendation, including acceptance, partial acceptance, or non-acceptance of the recommendations. Next slide. Uh, in our existence, the COB has made 31 policy recommendations overall, 27 of which MMPD has responded to. Those four that they have not responded to are from our most recent report that we presented last month, and so they're still within their allotted 45-day response period, so those numbers, those four will not be counted for or against them uh, in the metrics I'm about to discuss. So of those 27 policy recommendations to which uh, MMPD has responded, they've fully incorporated 11 of those recommendations, which is just under 41%. They've partially uh, incorporated six of those recommendations, or t just over 22%, and they have not incorporated 10 of these recommendations, or 37% of the recommendations. If you go to the next slide, you'll just see an example from one report. This is from our soft empty hand control report that we released in October of last year. So you can see on the left-hand side uh, is the full text of the recommendation in the middle those uh, handy pictures that guide whether or not the implementation recommendation was implemented, and on the right, notes regarding how the implementation was or was not, uh, how the recommendation was or was not implemented. And so I did that for all of the policy advisory reports that we have released in our existence, and I will continue to add to this report as we continue to make policy advisory reports and or as uh, MNPD responds to our recommendations. So that's sort of the long and the short of it. As I mentioned, this is just a factually based report. There's no opinion um, and there's no recommendations. It's just an, an, another effort at uh, transparency and monitoring what MNPD is doing with recommendations we make, both from a policy and from an investigative perspective. Um, so you can go to the next slide. Uh, if the board has any questions or discussion they would like to uh, lead, I'm happy to answer any questions to the extent that I can. Any questions for Mr. Carl Williamson? Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, yes, Mr. C.W. Uh, if in fact we're looking at red X's, which basically mean that they did not incorporate our policy recommendation, uh, do we have an opportunity to revise and circle back on that? If, if we feel as though it's important, does that come back to the board and the board gets a chance to say, Mr. Chair, well, that one's really important. Let's see if we need to reshape that one, or how does that work? Well, in the past, 
So I'll, I'll give the soft empty hand control as an example. That recommendation was made in two separate policy advisory reports before it was implemented. So it was made in a policy advisory report sort of in tandem with when the mayor had his policy policing commission that was made as a recommendation by the board then. Um, my predecessor, Dr. Valier, then tracked whether or not they had implemented that maybe eight to 10 months after that, found that they hadn't. And we as a board and as a department had internal discussions about which recommendations were important to us. And we, we picked that one as being particularly important. So then we released a whole expedited report just on that particular recommendation. So I would say that is, it is within the bounds of this board to yeah. reconsider recommendations that have not been implemented. I really appreciate the effort, Mr. Williamson. And this actually is very illuminating. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I, I like the nickname, Mr. CW. So you can keep using that if you'd like. I blew it so badly the first time I tried it. I would like to acknowledge uh, Commander Lohr if you've come up, but I, I would want to uh, give the board an opportunity if they have any other questions, and then I'll allow uh, Commander Lohr to address. Are there any other questions from the board on this report? Okay, Commander Lohr. Good evening. So I just want to start by uh, saying that, uh, you know, Chief Drake always thoughtfully um, considers all the recommendations given by the board. Uh, and I think that he has shown that by the responses he's given to these police advisory reports. Um, one of the things I want to make sure is that we're looking at the same information because I'm a little bit, I, I'm a little bit confused because I don't know if we're, we're maybe looking at the same information. Uh, as preparing for this, uh, this meeting, I was actually given some information regarding the police ad advisory reports and, you know, our compliance with your recommendations. Um, thank you. And and uh, thank you, Director. And so I wanted to make sure that we are looking at the same information. So uh, looking at the reports from the, the police advisory reports starting in April of 2020 through the, the one that was approved by the board on October 27, 2021, we're not looking at the last one that was uh, received June 6. So that, that one's not being uh, being considered. But we had uh, five different reports that were, that were considered uh, or that were recommended. So they had the first one was the police advisory report examining lo local law enforcement policies and immigration enforcement actions. That was the first one, April 2020, um, that was approved by the board April 2020, and the MMPD responded in June of 2020. Um, out of that report, we had four recommendations. Um, recommendation one was agreed upon, accepted. Recommendation two, and I, I don't have the actual recommendations, but if we want to go into that report, you can actually find those in that actual report. Recommendation two was referred to Metro Legal. Mm -hmm. Recommendation three and four were both agreed upon. Mm -hmm. And um, so I don't know if I can actually, I don't know if, if that report is actually posted. Yes, ma'am. Are you talking about the uh, the policy advisory report enforcement examining local law pol law policies and immigration enforcement action? Yes, ma'am. Is that, that was under Chief Anderson? Um, this was, I'm not, this was uh, from April 2020. So yeah. uh, I believe that it might have still been there uh, and Chief Anderson was might have still been there at that time. Yeah, um, we, have, we have, we have conflicting information on that. Okay. 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 And then, so that's, that's the first one. And again, that may be some, some information that, that may not be uh, across the board mm -hmm. that we're not seeing, I guess, here. The next Next one was the policy advisory report on the eight can't wait use of force. Um, that was policy recommendation. That was from June 24th. That was approved by the board June 24th. Um, and that was really, there was no recommendations on there, uh, but the report just detailed existing MNPD, com MNPD compliance. One of the, rec the recommendations regarding shooting at or from moving vehicles was addressed in response to this consent decree uh, response. The next one, the police advisory report on use of force consent decrees, which was uh, approved by the board October 23rd, 2020, and it was uh, responded by the chief on, on February 2021, had initially seven recommendations, and then on June 24th, a, a eighth recommendation was, was made. Out of those, the recommendation that was made on June uh, 24th was partially accepted. Apart from there, recommendation one, two, and three were all accepted. Recommendation four was partially accepted. Mm -hmm. Recommendation five and six were accepted. And recommendation seven was initially partially accepted, and now it's, it's been implemented. When you go to the uh, next one, which is the police advisory report on MNPD hiring procedures, which was approved by the board on May 26, 2021, and date, uh, MNPD responded on July 21st, I'm sorry, July 19, 2021, there were 11 recommendations made. Um, those are the hiring procedures, uh, police report on hiring, MNPD hiring procedures. 
MNPD responses to the hiring procedure report accepted nine of those recommendations and we had two partial acceptances. And the last one, recommendation to require reporting of soft hand hand control. Uh, the date uh, that the board approved it was October 27, 2021 and the, the department responded on December 6, 2021. There was two recommendations and both of those were accepted. So when you look at those numbers, um, again, from the information I have, and I know there may be a little confusion on that first one, uh, but I'm seeing five policy advisory reports throughout uh, through October, 2021. Out of those, there were 25 recommendations that I we've, we found that the board has made. Um, out of those 25 recommendations, recommendations, 20 were fully accepted um, and four were partially accepted. So 80% were fully accepted, 16% were partially accepted. That's a 96% uh, that were at the very least partially accepted and only one was referred to Metro Legal. So uh, again, I just want to make sure that, that we're all looking at the same information because the information that I have, um, that I was I gathered from what we have, shows that we are, I, and I'm not saying I don't know how the information, we may somewhere down the line where we're not connecting with our information, but 40% um, and 80% on fully accepted um, is, is quite a big of a difference. And then 96% of at least a partial acceptance um, tells us that we are, uh, the chief is, is thoughtfully considering all of the recommendations and, and he's, uh, accepted the majority of them, all but really one, which was referred to Metro Legal and which was uh, had to do with the immigration enforcement actions was something that they had to deal with. So I just want to make that clear and I, I again, want to make sure that we're on the same page uh, with information we have. Yeah, I appreciate you going into that. Um, I think where part, part of it is, is misinformation or miscommunication. The other part is there, what this report is doing is not, I agree with your numbers, the way that you, you write them in terms of the department said in writing that they have accepted whatever number you, you said, 90% of the recommendations. However, I think that there's a difference in accepting a recommendation on paper and actively implementing the recommendation into policy. And so the disparity in, in our numbers here, I think is not based on you know Chief, Chief Drake's formal response or Chief Anderson's formal responses to our policy advisory reports, it's in the implementation of those reports, or the implementation of those recommendations. So I think that this report, what we have here and the numbers that you have there, there's a difference in our interpretations, so we should uh, hammer them out, and I'm not, I'm not sure that the board meeting is the appropriate venue for that, but I do appreciate you flagging those because they're, that, that is sort of the, the impetus for this report is, is Accepting recommendations on paper versus implementing them in policy are two different things. So, yeah, I'll leave it at that. I'd like to recognize Dr. Hilder. Thank you, Chair. Thank you first for this report. I always love to see data and I love the colors. And thank you, Commander Laura, for your response. There's a little bit in this and where I'm actually delighted with the messiness of this conversation because it shows that we are still growing. Uh, so uh, if this is a semi-annual report and we haven't really been in this policy business very long, we are still working this out. And so I think in the call and response, you actually addressed a couple of things that I wrote down and it was sort of like the difference between acceptance versus implementation. So I almost would love to see the column, here was a recommendation, stop lights for acceptance, stop lights for implementation, and then the tension discussion notes. And I was wondering out loud in my head as well, is this the place to hear the back and forth? Because I don't know about my board members, but I'm like, okay, bring it. <laughs> I was like, when well, we hear this. But, but to be, you know, to make that really work, I think it would have to be, this was MNCO's interpretation of what was non-implementation. And then I would also like to see in the same written report what the police department's interpretation of implementation was, right? And maybe the face-to-face -face could be, let's talk about what's in the Delta. So, so I'm almost thinking, um, and board members think with me out loud, you know, we think about in our legislative bodies, particularly at the state level, where it's bicameral, you know, there's a Senate and there's representatives. If there are two conflicting versions, there's a reconciliation hearing, right? Uh, and a process and something comes out and maybe that's publicly noticed at a different time or maybe it happens before or after the main event here. But it seems to me that there is extreme value 
in what just happened here, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in what is happening here. Let me put that in the presence in the continuing tense. And um, fairness, you know, which seems to be a predicate of justice that we're all committed to, means that we don't ever want to have, we don't want to perpetuate misunderstanding simply because there wasn't an opportunity to reconcile information. We would hate for the public to go away thinking that there's a big red X when in fact we were in violent agreement. We just didn't hear each other say that, right? So I just wanted to give strong encouragement to everybody to lean into what would make this process go better. I am sitting on the sidelines. I don't have a recommendation. I just want to float the questions and be extremely um, supportive in the experts figuring out what this looks like the next time it becomes before this board and this public. So thank you for being in the trenches and doing hard, deep, and good work. Thank you. I think one of the things would be is sharing that information. I mean, like if you have information, we have this report, maybe sharing that report um, so that we um, both have an understanding and maybe some of this could um, have a conversation prior. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's pretty much all I have to say about that. Judge Brown? No, I agree with Dr. Hildreth. Um, just in looking over it, and obviously haven't had a chance to study it in detail, but you know, the interpretation of acceptance and then implementation, I think, is the, I mean, it makes a big difference in uh, your statistics and, you know, news media and everything latch on to statistics and such. So I think the idea of having a semi-annual report is an excellent idea. Mm -hmm. I would like to see, though, before we publish it as the board, that there be some sort of reconciliation committee or something where we make sure we at least, if the police think they have implemented it uh, and we don't, that you know we at least understand what the difference is. Uh, and I think that takes a, a vetting between uh, the commander and uh, you know can be a committee of some sort to 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 help work that. But I would think we would need you know a 30 or way we meet monthly, 30 or 60 day period between uh, our, our putting out our uh, draft and then putting it out as a, as a final report. I will say on that report that was called the, um, the policy advisory report enforcement examining local law policies and immigration enforcement actions. Um, in fairness of the police department, that was a different chief. There was a lot of um, conversation back and forth with Chief Anderson, the former chief. Um, and I don't know if that information was um, given to the current chief. I, I mean, uh, Chief Hagar might have been in some of those conversations, but I'm sure he didn't know of every email um, that um, Chief Anderson um, had sent to the sent to me and then me to the board from tw that was in 2020. So we might have to share that information with you because from what we the, the last that we heard of it, these things were just as Gavin sa stated were not implemented. So if there has been some implementation in a way that we're not um, aware of or the changing of language or something that, of that nature, then that's something that we need to know. Yes, ma'am, I think that's a good idea for just to meet and talk about it and, and kind of uh, compare what we're looking at. And I think it'll be a little bit easier to come up with uh, an actual information, you know, him looking at um, implementation, we're looking at the actual policy acceptance. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that does make a difference. And so we want to probably sit down and, you know, kind of go over this information, make sure that we can all be at least working with the same information uh, and looking at the same uh, uh, factors, I guess, in this and then coming to the same, try to get to the same conclusion. So. Absolutely, and just in brief response to that, it, you'll note in the notes section of all of this, I, I have incorporated whether or not the recommendation was accepted in writing, partially accepted, et cetera. But I do think Dr. Hilder's idea is a good one to put in a fourth column here, recommendation accepted, recommendation implemented notes, so that we can very quickly, very visually see where uh, the disparity is and, and go from there. Ms. Spencer? Well, thank you again for um, for the report and for um, the testimony as well. Um, I 
I've kind of come away from looking at this, and I also really want to thank Dr. Hildreth for her words as well, because from just the initial kind of perception of the disparity, it does feel rather more so kind of misleading on some end, like from my perspective. And the discrepancy is so wide that it sends up a lot of red flags for me. Um, and I think for me, like as we do get more into, and I think around the whole reconciliation process, that you know, if we are doing this report on a semi-annual basis, I would, you know, also perhaps like the reconciliation committee meets a little bit more often than that. So maybe on a, perhaps like once a quarter or something along those lines. I'm sure would love to entertain further discussion on something like that. But I, I think the thing for me is, is really. A, this part, the part of me is really trying to grapple with the disparity um, because I just find it, I just don't entirely understand the full logic around the difference between just the acceptance in writing rather than full in, in implementation of policy. And so it feels like that is a, the dividing line. And for me, I'm still processing just like what does this mean as in terms of just like, well, we accept this like in writing, but it's not implemented. And so that does not necessarily, it does not necessarily breed or just like encourage, I feel like almost like trust and transparency as well. Because uh, to me, like, and, I'm, and perhaps this might be a little bit reductionist, but I'm thinking about, you know, um, so if I like, basically made this whole recommendation to like another person, hey, you should do X, Y, and Z. And they're like, okay, and they just don't do it and don't follow through, then what was the whole point? And so to me, it feels like, well, I understand that there is this difference in interpretation, and yet I also feel like I don't, because it feels like if it, this is around policy, and so why, why, are we, why are we accepting that policy changes need to be made and then not implementing them? And especially to this degree where there's such a large disparity between you know, our own numbers and our own understanding and what the police department's understanding is. It feels like just the, just the difference of numbers is, almost feels very overwhelming. Like not just like, it's like also on like an emotional level as well, because then I also think about, okay, well, how would I explain this to my mama? You know, how would I explain this to like anybody else on the street? And I feel like everybody would look at me like, it would, it would, it would take a lot of convincing. Um, not to say that there is necessarily like malicious intent or anything being done, but it would take a lot of convincing, I feel, from like, if I just asked someone on the street, like, hey, did you know this was going on? And so, I don't know. I don't know if that's particularly like encourages more productive conversation, but it's just it's just my instincts give me give me pause here around that. And I do really want to entertain, you know, more of more of a process in which we can have this common ground on which to in which to have these conversations and in which to understand the impact of what's going on by the work. Mr. Abdullah, I believe, was next. Oh. Yeah. I'm just curious to know, um, do the police department get the reports that we give? And, and if so, so the, the police department would see that this report and this report is not necessarily driving together, right? They don't get that. Yeah. They, this no. is their original policy advisor. Okay, so so the the report that we're seeing, the police department don't actually. I mean, unless they look it up online, but we don't. I don't. Send, we haven't sent that to the police department. That's why I was saying maybe that there should that should be sent to them. But don't, at this point, it has not been. Sent. It has not. Okay. All right. That's all I wanted to know. I I, um, I did want to. Oh, go. I'm sorry. I'm not. Right. Dr. Hilder. Thank you, Member Spencer. I always love the, the, the interaction because then my brain goes. So I almost want to think about the column, was it accepted? Was it implemented? If it was implemented, on what date? Mm. And what are the receipts? Mm. So it was implemented because it's now in the roll call book on page 47. 
or is implemented, we now have a handout and it's now a training module that has happened, right? Or it was accepted but we haven't implemented it yet because we said we were going to implement it in the training academy and we haven't hired faculty and revised the curriculum yet. Do you see where we're going? Mm -hmm. Because I think that that would be a do To your point, how I explained to mom and them, they, they said they would do it, they just haven't had a chance or I don't know, they said they would do it but I haven't seen the receipts, right? right. So right. asking for some sort of granular like when? And what are the evidence? I think would take a long way from us being able to clear the file and see where the real blinking red lights are. That's how I kind of heard you, Member Spencer, and I'm wondering if that's a helpful way to articulate some process. Yeah, and if, if I could, uh, ma'am, I think that's exactly what I think we need to look at is what metrics are being used to say show implementation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, is it is it written in the policy? If it's written in the policy, is now considered implemented? Is there some other metrics that is being used? Once we can figure out what the metrics and, and what we're using to actually gauge if these are being implemented, then we can go ahead and move forward and, and be able to show if it truly was implemented or not. We definitely say that we have accepted these, and I know that we are moving forward into implementing all of them. If they haven't been all been implemented at all, you know, just because of time or, or uh, for whatever reason, but the chief, when he accepts it, his goal is to implement what he has accepted. And so we'll have to look and see is, again, what are the, what are the metrics that we're gonna use to show that these are considered implemented? And once we can find that out, then I think it's be a lot easier for us to work together, be able to say, yes, this was implemented because this is the metric we're gonna use and we have met that metric, or no, it has not been implemented yet because of X, Y, and Z. So once we get that, I think it'll be a whole lot easier to be able to have this discussion once we are on the same, using the same, I guess, rules uh, when it comes to uh, being able to show what is been implemented or not. Thank you, and Chair, just to conclude my remarks, I think that that's exactly right, Commander Laura, because it harkens back to our discussion last month when we were still working on what are the national standards and definitions and how do we reconcile so that we know when there's compliance, non-compliance, right? So my encouragement would be for the MNPD and MNCO to come up with a common frame of reference around implementation, which is, it's in the policy book, it showed up in roll call training, it's in the curriculum, whatever the things are, mm -hmm. and then come give us a training on the things and how to watch whether things are visible or not visible. Thank you. Uh, okay, Mr. Crow Williams, I'll recognize you, and then it was Judge Brown, and then Mr. Wynn. Okay. This is just a, a question for Commander Lara. So I, I am in support of, of everything you've been discussing. So in your opinion, who are the people from MNPD who need to be in the room with MNCO to answer those questions and to get those implementation metrics? Is it you, is it, yeah, just your opinion on that would be great. Um, my opinion is that there's there's people that are going to be there's different people that are involved in, in implementing different recommendations. So um, I would go back to the department and figure out who those specific people are to show that these were implemented. So that's something that there's no one specific person. Um, there's usually people from different you know different divisions, different bureaus that would need to be involved. Um, and that's something I would have to go back and and figure out. You know, once I uh, inquire with uh, the executive staff. Okay, and I hope I didn't look. I, I thought it was Judge Brown, Mr. Wynn, and then I heard Ms. McCree. Oh, so, so I didn't see the green. I'll defer for a while. Okay, thank you. Ms. McCree? Okay, then Mr. Wynn. Yes, so, so help me out with this process. So the board formulates the policies, the policies that we advise the department to implement. It's in writing, it goes to the department. They evaluate it, then they send us back what they accept or what they don't accept. Why aren't we in the room with the police department discussing policies? I mean, it, it, and this is just a question for the whole board. Um, best practice for law enforcement today, it wasn't the past, but today, is to ask the question, who do you police? Who are your communities you police? How does that policing affect those communities. And if it affects those communities in a you know, good or adverse way, you should have someone in the room in policy development 
to save their two cents worth for that policy. In other words, if we have something that we want to implement at the police department, then we should be in the room with the police commanders writing the policy on critical policies instead of us making recommendations and a week or two later, a month or two later, and a month or two later, them saying we accept it or we don't, or we put it in the policy, we're going to put it in the policy. It seems to me that the police department should have someone from this board oversight, oversight board, in the, in the meetings on policy. And if we are, then if you're our representative, you can come back and say they accepted A, B, and C. They implemented into Chapter 5, 6, and 7 of the use of force policy, but they didn't implement this. And then we could have a discussion on what we need to say to the police department so they'll understand how strong we feel about anything we recommend to them. Other than that, you're going to spend months and months and months back and forth over policy uh, recommendations when our representative needs to be in the room with the, with the chief. Now, it's just a, it may be too radical, but it just seems to me common sense that the people who you impact, and we are the voice of the people, this is oversight board, should have some oversight and um, play a part, uh, equal part in, in uh, recommendations on policy. So that's all I have. I want to recognize myself on that. Um, that is part of it, uh, and I think that's that's something I think is, uh, should be a priority to actually look at. But one of the intents of the board was that And I do want to say, uh, uh, Mr. Crow Williamson, he's always always very detailed, and I appreciate the reports. But uh, you know, and I'll say this wouldn't be happening if he didn't do this actual report. But this is the first pass of this, so I think it's good information, it's good dialogue, and I do want to command command the law that the detail that you're going into it with a response. So, uh, and what that tells me is the more the, the more that we can cooperate, Nashville is going to be better for it. So this is a pretty good example where the need to cooperate. All right. Anyone else? Okay, uh, Mr. Whistle. Um, I just want to say that I so appreciate this conversation and the work that was done that led up to this. Um, I had this thought before Member Wynn uh, mentioned that the idea of someone being in a room. I wholeheartedly agree with that. I also think about, I was thinking about timeline and how these um, recommendations are accepted, but um, I just, in thinking about um, Chief Drake's responses, it would be nice to have to, to have that in the response, like what, when when this change is going to happen, when this concrete thing would be put into place, where it will be, um, as as Dr. Um, Hildreth mentioned, like what what is the thing and where, but when we could find it, when we could expect that thing to be implemented. So I want to keep that the timeline thing, whether we're in the room or whether we're not in a room, that um, just having an idea of when that would happen, I think, uh, would be helpful. Even if that's not precise, but a roundabout idea, I think that would be helpful for me and the board.
Um, uh, this is very quick. I wanted to comment upon the women's uh, comments being in the room. And personally, I think that I think that's a lot of money. And really, I, I feel that one, like, at least one member of the board, you know, should be on there. I don't think it's necessarily asking too much in that regard. I think it's something that we should really encourage to be implemented as a form of best practice. Especially, again, considering the purpose of this body is not just in accordance with the charter, but in accordance with what the Okay, looks like we're back. Yep. Um, yes, basically, from what I was saying before, I well, I really think that that should just be best practice and a standard that we should be following. Um, where there are opportunities where the COB and where this office and MNCO can, can provide even better oversight and be present in rooms where decisions are being made. I think that's something that we should strive for um, on a continuous basis. Um, again, just because in my understanding, that is you know, the whole purpose of our being. Um, so it makes total sense. And I just want to say, I don't think it's too radical. I think it's common sense. Not to Mr. be rude, but mm -hmm. just being saying that. Mr. Wynn. And then Mr. Holloway. Yeah, one, one, one quick thing, it, you know, the policy development is is developing it, it's administering it, it's evaluating it. You can't, you have to have all three. There's nothing wrong with this board recommending to the chief that the most important policies to us have a loop in the policy that requires an annual evaluation of the policy. That's the way to make sure that you don't fall into the 30-year rule in government. And 30-year rule in government is, we've been doing it 30 years, we're just going to keep it doing 30 more. That's, we've all seen that happen, and that means the policies are stagnant until there's a major incident and somebody says you're out of date, you're out of, the laws change, the attitudes have changed, the, you know, the community changed. So there's nothing wrong with, I think, this board asking for those policies, and we already know them, you, you evaluate them every day, director, uh, director. You, you go to the SOP manual and the policy manual, so you know the ones that, that you um, use, why not ask there be an evaluation process? And in that evaluation process, be included a member of the COB to be in the room when the policies are evaluated. And never mind the policies that we want, just the policies that are there that need to be evaluated. Because if we make a recommendation, they say we agree with it, and they don't change the policy, then we're, we're not going anywhere. We're just spinning our wheels. So that's just, a, just food for thought on how it should be handled uh, if we want to say on the direction of the department. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Holloway. All of you make good points uh, what you've been saying about the whole process. But um, looking at the police department, we don't work for them and they don't work for us. But it's a good tool to have open communication where the police department can see if they have a better communication with us and, and seeing that we do represent the community, they would have a better uh, relationship with the community. The more you 
show them that you are uh, policing for everybody, then the more you can get from the community and more that, that we can do for them. So that's the main thing, you know. Uh, but it's a, it's a hard pill to swallow, you know. You know, you being a chief, right? they don't work for me. <laughs> and that type of thing. But, but what we're trying to do, we're trying to create a dialogue where we can represent the community, everybody in, in Davidson County. Thank you. As I was looking over this policy, uh, this which you which you provided, when I'm looking at the reason, I, I don't see a specific reason on why they're not implementing the policies. And so I think that that's missing from this this um, dialogue here. Is for instance, when we look at the eight can't wait nationally, all eight of those particular um, policy re recommendations, most most cities across the country implemented those. Um, and then we didn't have but one, I guess, that wasn't implemented. But I didn't understand why. We never really got the full reasoning behind it, especially since the IACP had accepted all eight of those. So I was wondering why MNPD, um, even though you know what your national best practices are, they're out there, even you know um, other police organizations and policy, um, uh, policy uh, people, who write the policies for the police departments across the country, the Department of Justice as well, um, why MNPD would not implement policies that are best practices. And so I would think that having that information as we're going forward on why the policy wasn't implemented would be helpful for us to have a better understanding. Okay. All right, any other questions for uh, either Mr. Crowell Williamson or Ms. Uh, Commander Laura? Thank you. All right. Uh, next item is uh, the proposed resolution report uh, MNCO CC 2021 uh, 005. Mr. Milner? Uh, Mr. Chair, I, I trust I'm that out of order, but, but before we move from the executive director's report, uh, which I think we've been discussing, I just want to beat this horse one more time about this budget position. Okay, now we, we have left the director's report. We were on the oh, okay. the evaluation. Yeah. Uh, we left that a long time okay, ago. Okay, if but, I could just find it. Uh, uh, I, I will permit you to. Go thank ahead. You, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I just wanted to read the mayor's response, just one paragraph, if I may, uh, to the issue that addresses that position in legal, okay? It says, the COB success is vital to Nashville's success. Mayor Cooper is a strong supporter of the Community Oversight Board. The mayor's proposed budget provided funding for four new positions in the Community Oversight Board. Two investigators, one professional specialist, and one administrative services manager. It also provides funding for one, uh, funding for one attorney. Sounds like an FTE to me, okay? For one attorney at the Metro Legal Department to help the COB address and work through legal issues. This is a staffing increase of 50%. So they included that FTE in legal Metro as a part of the calculation of the 50% increase. That sounds like a COB position to me that needs to report to the director. And I would like to ask whomever to provide this clarification based upon this document from John Bunn, who, who, who was representing that, in this particular case, uh, the mayor's office. I, I, need, I would like to have an answer to that. It sounds like it's a position that should report to the, to the, to the uh, uh, MNCO. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, just for the record. Thank you, Mr. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Ms. Spencer, you wanted to comment on that? Yes. Oh, go ahead. I would also like to be on this dead horse a little bit um, because I think even from even from the response, the response to me did not necessarily feel like it was, I'm trying to think of a very, of the best way to say this, of perhaps the best position and one that fully makes sense regarding what, what our organization asked for specifically. I think from this, it makes it does not make sense to me that there was a position added for an attorney where there is still, as I understand, no guidelines into how that person fits into a structure, you know, that's supposed to be assisting, but we have no that was but that recommendation that was done without our consent. And then just 
thrust upon us with no additional information as to how that's all going to work out. It does not fully make sense to me, especially given that we were very clear with what we were asking for and what we needed. And I think what is really truly missing from the full response, and if I have looked at the data correctly, um, even the data that was given around you know, our successes, um, around complaints and everything, is that it did not, it feel like it totally kind of ignored the points that we fully made. You know, thinking even just around, um, just around just the necessity for all of the positions, mm -hmm. it does not feel like that adequately addresses all of the positions that we asked for. Mm -hmm. It felt more so like, you know, I don't know, what is the, I'm trying to think of the best way to put this in a way that feels like it makes sense to me. Um, more so like, I don't know, if I, if I basically trusted, if I trusted a friend to give me X amount of like candies back, and then all of a sudden he gives me, you know, four of them and then just adds in some weird rock that is supposed to be a candy. That's what it more so feels like to me mm -hmm. because it does not make sense. And I just do not fully understand um, the whole, I do not understand this position currently. And like, I just, I don't know. It just, I just, there needs to be so much that needs to be fully explained with this whole position. Um, and I still feel like there's even more to be explained with the denial of the rest of the positions that um, weren't approved. So. Okay, and there's a lot of discussion, and, and this is great discussion. Uh, is there any form of a motion or anything that, uh, is anyone ready to make a motion? Okay. All right. Then we will move on. Can I add one thing? Okay. I did want to just make notation that on Mr. Mutton's report on the very last page in the second paragraph, he says that fund, the OPM recommended providing funding for two additional investigator positions, bringing the total number of investigators to six. So that's incorrect. It is five. Um, so just wanted to note that, that if, in fact, they thought that it was six, it's not. It's five. And I will reply back, you know, to the letter. So if, I guess if there's, I, I can try to capture all of this and that, that's the minimum that I can, I can do on that. Uh, and yes, it, it, it uh, again, yes, that, that came up in a lot of other discussions, but yeah, that, uh, I definitely see the points on that. Okay. All right. Uh, Ms. Spencer. Sir. Uh, I've been trying to wrestle with the motion, but for right now, I can't think of one that I feel is perfectly adequate and fully encapsulates what the severity of what I think has happened. Um, but I really do, um, I would love the response. And so I think currently that's the main thing that I can think of right now. Okay. So, so I will respond. I will respond to the letter and I will get input from other board members. Okay. Uh, now we are. We're at uh, resolution report CC 2021-005, Director Fitcher. All right. On February 23rd, 2021, and this is in relation to CC 2021-005, which involved a hit and run that occurred on May 16th, 2020. On that date, the complainant was the passenger in a vehicle with her husband as she, uh, as the driver, her husband as the driver and her two minor grandchildren in the back seat. While stopped at a stoplight, the complainant's vehicle was hit from behind by an alleged drunk driver who left the scene, hitting the car a second time while leaving. The complainant alleged that Officer 1, who was the reporting officer on scene, uh, and Officer 2, who performed the follow-up investigation, were neglectful in their duties. The complainant further alleged that Officer 2 was discourteous and discriminated against her because of her race by not prosecuting the case as aggressively as he would have had she been a white woman. 
After reviewing the MMPD investigation of the case, it was clear that Officer One failed to gather all the witness names and contact information on the scene and had a, and had a duty to do so. When Officer One arrived, another officer who was not assigned to that area and the complainant herself had already begun the process of getting contact information from the multiple witnesses who were present. Both the other officer and the complainant attempted to give Officer One sheets of paper with the witness contact information. Officer One took the paper from the other officer, but not from the complainant. He also did not compare the two sheets of paper to see if both had all the same names and contact information. According to the complainant, Officer One told her he did not need to speak to more than one witness, which didn't strike the complainant as correct. In the days following the incident, the complainant had to be very persistent in order to contact Officer One and give him the missing contact information. She called the precinct multiple times, the district attorney general's office, and spoke to a general sessions judge before she was able to make contact with Officer One. Officer Two did not attempt to contact any of the witnesses listed in the report until October 9, 2021. I'm sorry, October 9, 2020. The incident occurred on May 16, nearly five months previous to that. When the complainant was told Officer 2 was not able to get a hold of the two witnesses, she attempted to make contact with them and says she was able to make contact with both of them. Unfortunately, when the MNCO received the, this complaint in February of 2021 and made notifications to the police department of our intent to investigate, Officer 2 had already retired and was unable to be interviewed. Nonetheless, from the evidence obtained, the executive director, I was able to determine by a preponderance of the evidence reviewed that the allegations of inefficient performance of duties and adherence to rules against both Officer 1 and 2 were sustained. Without being able to interview Officer 2 and, a lim and limited only to the file on the record, the allegations of discrimination and discourteous, cur discourtesy were not able to be sustained by 51% of the evidence. Neither Officer 1 nor Officer 2 had any relevant disciplinary history. Adherence to policy is generally a Category D offense and discipline between one and four days suspension for the first offense. Inefficient performance of duty is generally cat uncategorized and correct it with guidance, training, and or formal or informal counseling. In this case, I recommended two-day suspension for the violation of adherence to rules and formal counseling for the inefficient performance of duties for both officers. And I will say um, a little bit more um, that there were at least 11 calls. I want to say between 9 and 11 calls, 911 calls that day. I listened to each one of those calls. There were multiple witnesses that were calling, giving a description with the tag number of the vehicle and the direction that the vehicle um, had fled. Um, also, um, if you read in there, um, in the report, uh, it had that the complainant um, was unable to make an identification. I don't know why she was the person that had to make the identification, being that she was a passenger, her grandchildren were in the back, and the driver of the vehicle, which was closer to where the vehicle was hit, would have been able to make a better um, identification of the driver. Um, but none of that happened anyway for many, many months. Um, and so I just wanted to make certain that you all understood how that looked. Um, she was rear-ended, and then the vehicle veered from the rear of the vehicle to, um, it moved to the left of the vehicle and hit the, the, pat, the driver's side of the vehicle. So it went this way, then that way, and then it fled off. And so I just wanted to make certain that you all understood that, and I'll take any questions. Any questions for Director Richard on the PR? Okay, I've, I've got Mr. One. Queen. I'm sorry. So the person who committed the hit and run mm -hmm. was never arrested. That's correct. So the case was never assigned to anybody after the officer retired? Is that? No. What happened was the, so what happened, there was, it just kind of laid around for a while. Um, it was assigned. Um, the officer who was the, the detective or the investigator of it um, basically um, did some work on the case, um, but what what happened was there was also an attorney um, from the complainant that was involved as well. Um, they. 
after the complainant was unable to make the identification, they kind of just let it, you know, sit around um, and didn't do much with the case. And that was because, of course, this misidentification um, that happened many, many months later. Mm -hmm. um, and really, at the end of the day, like I said, the complainant would have never been able to really make that uh, <laughs> make that identification because she didn't really see the complainant, I mean the driver, because the driver is on the opposite side, um, which didn't make a lot of sense to me. I think that you had the tag number, you could have, you, you, you had a tag number, you had a description of a driver, you had multiple people giving you that information who might have been able to make a better identification. That did not happen. And so the car was registered out of this county into another county. That was a little bit of the delay. Um, but officers stated that they, um, you know, like there was a, the car was supposed to be, you know, it turned down a street and it was, you know, someone said they saw it, um, it parked somewhere or whatever. Um, but there wasn't really a real pursuit for this drunk driver who totaled their vehicle. Um, and so I, I think that... Um, it just was, you know, I don't know, I just think it was a, an investigation that kind of, you know, languished around for a while. And no supervisors were involved in any of this decision making? No, there was a supervisor involved once the complainant was in, uh, able to get a hold of the, um, the, the, the um, officers involved. And I think that's when an officer got, I mean, a sergeant was notified, but not, not really connected in doing anything in follow up, no. So no reports where a sergeant said, what are you doing on this case? Uh, not that I, not to my knowledge, I didn't see that. Okay. Thank you. Ms. McCree. Is there a timeline or course of action written into MNPD policy on things of this nature? So while it did take some time, was there, is there a 60 day notice, something needs to be followed up on, 90 day notice, like, is there anything written into MNPD policy that would- I'm not really sure about whether it's in their SOPs, what you're saying, because that yeah. would be like in the SOPs. I do know that with cases like, with cases like this, um, you know, like, a hit and run fleeing, you know, and I mean, of course, we don't know if the person was intoxicated or not, but it's still a hit and run is a felony. Um, there were um, some s injuries, I mean, and the total damage of the vehicle was very expensive, so I'm assuming it was a felony. Um, and so I think with those types of cases, um, they can, you know, I don't know if they, you know, did much in regards to, of course, we know that if they had any, if they had 90 days or whatever it was, they did not meet that particular standard. Um, but as for leaving the case open for as long as it was open, um, I'm assuming that maybe that's a policy that they have that I have to, I, I don't know, I have to verify that um, in regards, and I'm just basing it on how they've done in previous cases where they have the opportunity to leave the case open and pending um, because of the fact that it is a felony, you know. But there wasn't any, like, active um, investigation, like, to find who this driver was and, you know, to hold that driver responsible. Thank you. Captain Laura, not to put you on the spot, um, but again, not speaking specifically to this case, but as far as the timelines, is there something written into MMPD policy that would give guidance to what could have happened, should have happened, in accordance to possible policy in MMPD? So we can look at the manual or the SOPs. I'm not familiar with either the specifics on those, but I can find out. But we would probably look at the SOP, Standard Operating Procedures, and see exactly what's written in there, if there is a timeline or something that they have in place uh, for that. So I can look in and find out, and I can send that information if you, you can, but I don't have anything off the top of my head of what exactly there is. There's no specific time frame of, of uh, you know, that, that's like a common practice to just tell them after this. But I believe that, you know, everybody has their own SOPs and some have uh, timelines, others don't. So um, I can go and look to that and get to that information for you, if that's okay. That's perfectly fine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else on the PR? Uh, Judge Brown? <clears throat> Our recommendation for Officer 2 involves a suspension is retired. Uh, 
I don't understand how that can go anywhere. Would we be better off making a recommendation that something go in his file in case he comes back or something? I mean, I, my concern is we've got a recommendation that it 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 can't be it can't be carried out, and I'm just wondering if there's something that could be carried out that could maybe get in his record to at least. Uh, you know, if he applies for another police department or, or that he's something in his record. I'm not sure whether that can be done or, or not because uh, right. uh, he is retired. But it, 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 it sort of bothers me that uh, it looks to me like he retired uh, in practice before he was officially retired. But uh, it just, you know, is there, is there something we can do that would have at least a little bite to it or at least possible bite? That's my only, that's my concern. Yeah, I did, uh, you know, talk this through with the with Attorney Yoon because I also felt like, you know, giving someone making a recommendation for a two day suspension and a person is no longer there. But if in fact he had been there, we would give him that two day suspension or something more substantial. Um, and then we also kind of went back and forth about whether or not if the officer came back to the police department. The likelihood of that happening after 34 years of service is very small. Um, you know, now if he had like 10 years, that would be something different. But with a 34-year long career, I didn't think that that would happen. So, and I don't know um, if, in fact, like we could, like I, you know, if we said if, in fact, if he had, if he returns, he would be looking at a two-day suspension. I don't think that that is sustainable. Um, and so we decided um, after that consultation to just go ahead and implement the two-day suspension, you know, um, because we felt like um, it, it really should have been more than two days. I mean, to, to be honest, on the, the dereliction of duty here. Um, but... Um, that's how we ended up with the two-day suspension. It could have been more, but I mean, the, the person has retired. It's not going to affect any type of retirement income. It's not going to do anything, but it is the fact that what, if a person, if he was here, and the fact that he did just let this investigation go, um, where two children were in the car, one suffered, you know, had a disability, the trauma that was triggered by that, and just the, just the one thing after the other that was left undone. This family family's car. They told them to move it here. I listened to the calls. They kept calling 911. They were there for many, many, many hours with their with the two with the two babies, the grandbaby, the, and not being able to have a tow truck come. Just a, a whole just domino effect of wrong misinformation, and it just was a really bad reflection on the city as well as the police department in general. Did you have something, Gavin? You want to add? Uh, Mr. Holloway, then Ms. McCray. Um, I don't know how long he's been retired, but if he hadn't been retired that long, I don't think he really is clear civilly, you know, even though he's retired from the police department, but that was the, his assignment for that particular day, and that's the type of work that he did on it. So civilly, I don't think he really cleared right now. It was in, depends on the time limit. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I will say that um, Attorney Yoon, um, I need to clarify, I said something about a felony, and he said it was classified as a misdemeanor with 11 months and 29 days to statute of limitations. I mean, I guess it was classified as a misdemeanor, but actually the damage to the vehicle, as well as, I don't know if they suffered any um, injuries that needed to be treated by a, a hospital, but it was a significant damage to their vehicle. Um, but anyway, the case was closed in February with the supervisor signing off on that. So they, they, they closed it in February, supervisor, you asked about the supervisor, and that supervisor signed off on the closing of the case. Ms. McCree. Judge Brown, I'm thinking about your last comment and how although the um, retired member is no longer with the department, um, I think still going forth with a two-day, um, although it means no real-life implications for him, um, sets a precedent uh, on what should happen, what could happen in a bar for, for later. Um, member Hildreth, you talked about 
putting things in the atmosphere that we may not be able to see later or none of us may be here to see. And so um, in a lot of our cases, a year has gone by, nine months has gone by, but still making decisions based on what is right and what is appropriate um, in the space and for that case. Um, as far as discipline, I think it's still extremely important even for that officer or in that case, it doesn't make a difference. Let me be clear. I'm not. I'm not opposed to the two-day suspension. Right. I, I think uh, that's perfectly appropriate. My thought was to get something in his record. Uh, granted, after 34 years, he may not be done. But you know, sometimes there's an application to do security work or to do uh, other things, and I, I'd like to see if it's possible to get it into his record. So at least there's something in the record. Mm -hmm. uh, I, 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 that's my thing is I would like to add to the recommendation of the director that uh, if possible uh, that no, it, uh, this uh, finding be noted in his uh, in his records uh, it, that may not be possible but it, it just sort of bothers me that it skates by well, once we finish the discussion there is a category uh, except except but modify so is and there any there, more discussion? Still, and there, there's still Officer One that we have to deal with too. Mm -hmm. So Officer One is still um, is not retired. So you know, Officer One still. I think um, I, the recommendation was that he um, be disciplined with a two-day suspension for violating the adherence to policy and rules, um, and also receive the form of counseling for his violation of the deficient performance of duties. Any further? Who is not retired? So who's mm -hmm. still on the department? So. Mr. Chair, then I can I'll make a recommendation the report to be adopted uh, but amended to uh, further recommend that the findings of the board be placed in his uh, personnel records if possible. Okay. Uh, given the categories of accept and send to MMPD police, accept but modify, reject, return to MNCO staff, uh, Judge Brown is... is uh, making a motion that we accept but modify with uh, with something in the in the personnel record. Is there a second? A second. Okay, it's been properly moved and second that uh, and this is for, this is for uh, officer two. Okay, this is for officer two. Uh, so it's been properly moved and second. Uh, is there any uh, discussion? And this is on MNCO CC 2021-005. Okay, uh, Mr. Milner. Uh, Mr. Chairman, just very quickly, you know, as I read through this case, I just found it very difficult to understand exactly what it was that we were really uh, trying to get at here. I mean, it sounds like to me, as I read and I, didn't, I know there's more information that basically they didn't do a thorough job of identifying witnesses, didn't accept the witness list from the complainant, and then this didn't follow up on the investigation. Mm -hmm. Am I kind of getting that That's right? Yes. All right, I mean, I've been, it, this is my fourth meeting, and we've had at least two cases like this in the Detectives Bureau, okay? And I'm just wondering if there's something more that that may be going on as far as resources or or, or just how we prioritize things that might get a, get us a little deeper into this this, this issue because it, it sounds like it was a lack of priority. So I seconded it for the point of discussion, for the purpose of discussion, so that I can get that on the record uh, to, to see if there's maybe something beyond what we're seeing here. Okay. I yield. Any other discussion? Okay. Uh, all in favor of the motion, uh, board re recommendation for policy uh, proposal, proposed re resolution MNC, MNCO CC 2021-05. Uh, all in favor of the motion, raise your hand. Any opposed? The motion for uh, Officer 2 passes. And now I, I would need a motion then for Officer One. I, I think my or, motion was it be approved with that addition. It with that addition, one. yes. And that's for Officer Two, right? For One and Two. My, my motion was it be approved for Officer 
approved for officers one and two with the addition Two. Okay, Mr. Okay, Mr. Chair. Okay, Mr. Chair, I'd, I'd recommend that you retake that motion just because there appears to be some confusion as, well, as to what people might have voted on. Yes. Okay. Would you restate your motion again? Well, uh, point of order. Okay. Point of order. Okay. Point of order. Hold on. Point of order. Uh, the motion that the judge made, which was quite proper, has already been second dealt with. It's been voted. Okay. Right? So going back to restate it would be a violation of parliamentary procedures if Thank you. it was the next meeting. Thank but you. I would like to offer a motion to add, to be clear, that the uh, board accept the recommendation uh, from the executive director as it relates to Officer One. Okay. Does that do the division? Is that the dichotomy you're looking for? I, I think that would accomplish it also. So. Okay, so I need a second on that then. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, it's been properly moved and second. It, is, is there any discussion? Okay, you revised the motion. No, I, I, it, it, was, it was asked that we take it as a separate motion just for clarification. Judge Brown's motion dealt clearly with Officer Two. I thought it dealt with Officer 1, too, but that's okay. You were asked by legal to separate. Okay, we followed through on Judge Brown's motion. Okay, so now this one is clarification. I understand that. Okay, is there a second? It was seconded by Mr. Abdullah? Okay, it's been properly moved and seconded. Uh, is there any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor of the motion, raise your hand. Opposed? Raise your hand. Okay, the motion passes. Thank you. All right, now, where are we? Uh, Dr. Hilder. Thank you, Chair. Before we leave PRRs generally, I'm having um, process wonderings, and I don't know if it requires action right now other than for us to think about it. This may be research that comes back to us later for a motion or further consideration. I am wondering if we need to spell out and think through what additional corrective actions might be for persons who have left the force, either by retirement or resignation. I would assume termination would need it, right? Or abated by death. But for those other two, because, and so uh, what would it mean to think carefully through a memorandum to the HR file, or are there other things? I always learn so much from member Win because I don't know how these things work, but are there other ways to get at potential indirect discipline or foreclose other opportunities? This is one of those matters where I think a little bit of consideration and board education so that we can add some process could be useful. And I would like to ask that we consider that for a future time. Um, my second process question is, where are we with remote review of the base file of these PRRs prior to voting? I need to admit that I came in almost disposed to um, abstain on these votes because I did not have an opportunity to come down and I wasn't quite sure that reading the excellent report that we had prepared and available to us was doing justice. I have taken to heart the commentary from members, including Member Brown and others, about you know if we're going to make real decisions that have impact, that everybody have due process. So I really want to fulfill my duty to look at these files, but I'm just going to tell you right now, and I think it's true for many of us, the stop, drive downtown, and do all of that is a barrier to due diligence and good service in our volunteer capacities. Many times our volunteer capacity is made possible by the fact that we keep our day jobs, right? So do you understand what the tension is here? So I just, I know that staff has been working on that. I was hoping that we could get an update on particularly what does it look like for us to be able to view information 
that isn't otherwise available? What does it mean to be able to view the um, video? Um, the, I'm sorry, the body-worn cameras. And what does that mean to possibly even schedule a video meeting with MNCO staff to be able to do so they can hold things up to the camera or press play? May we have an update on that? And thank you, Chair. Alex? Thank you, Director Fritchard. I didn't know if you wanted to comment or... I'll comment as well. Okay, I'm our attorney uh, Dickerson, we're so glad to have you here. Sure, um, we've, uh, we've sent a preliminary draft to ITS and they've, um, they're reviewing it now. There's obviously some technical information they need to include and with the confidential information that would be uploaded, this is kind of a little bit of a new uh, this is creating this MOU is a little bit different than our normal processes. So I know that it's still there. I don't know what the current update of it is. Um, as far as the issue about whether you could review these remotely using a video, um, obviously there's open meetings issues that we'd have to think through, but I know that um, that's something we can continue to talk about because I know that this wouldn't be a meeting uh, under the Open Meetings Act. Okay, a one-on-one -on -one video. Of going down because in full disclosure, um, a couple, several months back, there was an ice storm and I was on my way down and I didn't, didn't well, and, and, So I'm kind of like saying things on the record, but anyway. Um, <laughs> Sure, yeah, absolutely, and I agree. With, if it's a one-on-one, -on -one, it's not going to violate Open Meetings Act. There might still be some ITS security issues with that. So let me, and I realize that was done out of necessity, but um, I think that's something I, we still need to have a discussion. And, and I'm, I can communicate with the attorneys in our office who staff ITS and present this as kind of a new issue, and we can think through what that is. Yeah, and I would just like to add to that. I mean, we've been up and running for three years. We had a three-year anniversary for the staff on June the 17th, and this is not a new issue. And I'm, you know, I'm not trying to come down hard on Metro ITS or anyone, but in order for us to fulfill our obligation to the city, um, the board members have to have access to all of these documents, body-worn cameras, um, and all the other information. And we have been, for the last three or four months, kind of pushed off about they're going to be like making these decisions, but those decisions continuously get swept under the rug. And so I'm saying today on the record that this needs to be a priority with Metro ITS, with Metro Legal, um, and whomever else is involved. Okay. Thank you. All right. Any further discussion? Okay. We're going to move on to uh, uh, public comment, and I understand that uh, one of the complainants uh, I will let them go first, and then if there's anyone else that has public comment, then they will follow. We have, mm -hmm. we have um, the complainant is here. Um, you can state your name on the record, push the button, um, and then go ahead and make your comment. Got it? Help her. Thank you. Thank you. So, Thank you. My name is Diana Jenkins Brown. And you're welcome to have a seat, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening. We strongly ask if the board would reconsider all the complaints that we, the family, made that if the procedural policies had been followed as instructed, the outcome of our case would have been different. The hit-and-run drunk driver would have been apprehended, arrested, and brought to court to stand trial. Maybe if she had to be present before a court of law, she might think a thought twice before driving drunk again and leaving the scene of what could have been a deadly hit-and-run accident. She did not care if we, the victims, were severely injured or if we might have died because of her choice to drink and drag. She never had to face her charges or be held accountable for her action because she did not have a good address. 
The process has caused a lot of mental and physical effects on myself, my husband, granddaughter who suffered from nightmares, grandson who has autism, almost nonverbal. Now he refuses to sit in the back of the car where now he feels if he sits in the front, then he'll be safe. The hit and run accident caused regression, and we, the family, have fought so hard to get him all the services that he is due to help with his disability of autism. We fight to push him toward progression. Our granddaughter was still nervous, and she was afraid to begin a driver's training course. Our grandchildren were sitting in the back of our total car, seeing their fear, hearing them scream, their tears, the back window glass shattering all over them, being hit from the rear while sitting at a red light with the impact of a moving large Mack truck at 60 miles an hour flying off a hill. I feel that our case has left a warning to all citizens to not only record on your telephones when an event is taking place, but you must also record your phone calls because our hit and run case has proven that it is on the burden of proof of the citizen making the complaint to prove that the officer is uncaring, unruly, discourtesy in statements when it should be the officer's job to record and preserve statements. This protects the officer and citizen against he said, she said statements. This is evidence that proper protocol is followed. There should be proper training that all officers must follow and see a case fully followed through. And then if that officer closes the case, he retires, etc. The supervisor needs to follow up, checking on complete investigations and, and assuring that it is followed through. We do thank the Community Oversight Board, especially the lead investigator, Mr. Vernon Johnson, who is very thorough with the investigation of our complaint from the beginning to the end. He followed through, making me aware of each procedural process. This is what Officer 2, Mr. Steele, should have done. He told me that he had 11 months and 29 days to build a case of an investigation into our hit and run case. I told him if you wait that long, evidence and the hit and run driver can get away. I said to him, I'm not an investigator or a lawyer, but I am much educated, not poor, and I have common sense. I know that what he says does not help the victim. He never made us feel that he cared or he had any intentions to investigate our hit and run case from the beginning to the end. I do have a complaint that the Community Oversight Board's investigation of our complaint against the police officers not following procedure policies in which the police department is held accountable as far as we have determined, the timing should have never taken 15 months to complete when the statute of limitation is 12 months. I do understand that the overboard is fairly new and shorthanded on staff. This also has caused stress on the family. No in investigation should take that long to complete. The citizen is already upset about the drunk hit and run driver causing the almost deadly wreck, getting away with it, fleeing. The poor assistance that we received, we, we received at the scene of the wreck, the unacceptable investigation not started and completed by the hit and run investigation officer. The officer's poor performance of their duties, especially officer two, to us, the citizen, made us feel like the criminal who caused the hit and run accident, then the victim of the hit and run accident. There needs to be accountability. 
I am so thankful that the Community Oversight Board is in existence because it assures the citizen that the police is being policed. Is that not the responsibility and the job of the Office of Professional Accountability? And I want to answer the question, what um, I hope I have uh, used all my time. I did see that hit and run driver face to face. I did. My husband and I both saw her face to face. And when Officer Steele called me up on the telephone, he asked me to describe her. I told him she was a young, red-haired, white woman. He said, how do you know she was white? How do you know that she was young? How do you know she was a redhead? I told him, you got to be kidding me. I'm the victim. I didn't cause the wreck. We saw her. When we went down before the police department with my attorney, the reason I didn't identify her because it was trickery. He had all... In that, that's another thing, somebody needs to be present when that happens too. He had all young white women with red wigs on. I told him her face was fat. How was I supposed to identify? To me, that's a form of trickery. And that's why he didn't follow through with that case. I've said all I need to say, unless there's some questions, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am, for taking the time to uh, to come before the board. Thank, Thank you. you. Is there anyone else that has uh, public comment? Are there any written public comments? All right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next on the agenda is uh, new business and announcements. And I know, Director Richard, I guess you have at um, least one item I know about the nominating committee. Um, okay, so you want to do the first one or you want to do the nominating committee first? Uh, uh, just whichever order you prefer. All right, I, I'll go ahead and do this because the nomination committee might take a little longer. So, um, on as we were investigating, um, I'm sorry, as we were following up on um, one of Chief Drake's um, responses, which was um, CC 2021-043, um, which was the same one that Mr. Wynn brought up earlier um, in regards to uh, the chief's response. In the response, one of the OPA investigators mentioned in that response, you all received it, that um, there was some, let me pull it up, that there was some profanity that we missed. And I know I viewed the video, uh, it's an hour long video. I viewed it multiple times when it happened and I viewed it after I saw this allegation multiple times. It took me hours to go through it, stop it, go through it. What I did was ask the investigator who was handling this case to document the timestamps because I needed to know exactly where the profanity was located. Because there, what, what, what uh, the investigator from the OPA says is that there was where the officer says, and I won't say it, but he says, while conducting a review of the officer's body-worn camera, it was discovered that the officer stated F and pay for the F and meal in the presence of two employees of the restaurant. It is not clear from watching that officer's body-worn cam as to where the complainant was in proximity to the officer when he made the profane, profane statement. It is recommended that officer be disciplined for using profane profanity as consistent with the policy, and he says, uh, Section J, profanity. What I found to be really interesting and strange was that in the chief's response, he does not discipline the officer prof profanity. So even though it's mentioned in the OPA's investigation, which says a synopsis of the pr proposed resolution report, the chief still doesn't discipline the officer for using this profanity that we never heard. So then I asked the investigator to go back and send that particular investigator at OPA an email and ask them exactly where the timestamp was for this profanity. So that officer responded and gave us a timestamp. And in that timestamp, we went back, there's no profanity. But if you watch it really closely, I mean, you gotta watch it really closely, it had been redacted. It's clipped out of there. And so it was very shocking that this was happening. 
and then it brought up so many questions from us. How many other things have been redacted that we are unaware of? And it's done so professionally that you will miss it because it's very, very quick. And so we sent in, a, I asked, you know, and I got with um, Attorney Yoon and Mr. Uh, Williamson, and we sent an email to Chief Drake, because it's very concerning. And I'll read the email on the record. It says, Dear Chief Drake, on September 5th, 2021, we received body-worn camera footage in regard to MNCO complaint 2021-043. Um, MNPD incident 2021-0396022, involving an officer, um, Officer, well, we can say his name because the case has already been resolved, involving Officer Chapman's actions on 7-24-2021. In your June 13 response to the COB's resolution report, you included the OPA review by the detective at OPA, um, Officer White, who indicated that he heard the officer use profanity at body-worn camera 20 dash 54 seconds. After reviewing that portion of the body-worn camera footage the MNCO received, we noticed that the audio cuts off at the precise period of time. It is of the utmost concern to us that the evidence of misconduct by an officer we are investigating was redacted prior to being sent to us. I am requesting, number one, for what reason was that portion of the body-worn camera footage redacted? Number two, in all future audio, video, documentary requests, each redaction must be cataloged, the reason for each redaction specified, and that the log of redactions and reasons be sent to us along with the redacted item. Um, number three, the most up-to-date written policy for how and when the MMPD is making redactions to items that the MNCO is requesting. This is a permanent ongoing request in that if any changes are made to this policy, we would like to be updated as soon as practicable afterward. And number four, which I think is most relevant, is an audit of all the redactions that have been made by the police department and sent to MNCO previously, prioritized by the most recent first, and a log of each redaction and the reasons thereof or therefore sent to us as soon as practical. Thank you for your kind and urgent attention to these requests. Wow. Okay. Is there any any discussion? Uh, any questions for Director Fitcher? Okay. Well, some because Okay. I, I, I think Ms. McCree wants to go first. Is okay, Ms. McCree's going. Oh, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. You're fine. Um, is there any way, I know after reviewing the footage, it's really hard to tell, is there any way we can guarantee that we're getting the original footage? Is that not in our MOU? Like, I have so many questions. There's a lot going on in my head, but let's start there. Yeah, our MOU, um, the, the one that we have with not, not only MNPD, but also with the um, DAJ, with the District Attorney General, we are supposed to get unredacted. Um, unredacted, let me just read, the, read it to you. We are supposed to get unredacted body-worn camera footage, except for the caveat where we had an addendum. And what that addendum says, there are some protected classes that we aren't supposed to get, that we, you know, depending on what they are, they're special cases. Those would be any, it says records or information with a record not subject to disclosure under the code would be recs and rape and sex crimes related to adults, child sexual abuse records and information, child abuse records and information, domestic violence and orders of protection juvenile offenses, health and mental health health and mental health records, mm -hmm. confidential informant information, criminal intelligence information, um, that includes field interviews, crime stopper tips, expunged arrest records and files, and they have the codes that support this, um, certain types of TBI records, and any information that is gleaned from NCIC ties or netlets, um, inlets, and protected under TBI or FBI rules. This is not any of those. Exactly my thoughts. So, again, to echo what you said, if 
something like profanity is being taken out, how can we guarantee <laughs> the other critical information that we need that does not fit within the protected um, exemptions in the MOU are not being taken out? And how can we find out who's responsible for taking out this information that could be essential to the work we do here on the board? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, that's a good question. So that's what we're waiting on their response. And I just want to like put this in your head. Like, they remove misconduct during a misconduct investigation. I think uh, Mr. Wynn was next, and I think Dr. Hilliard is still thinking about it. Maybe, okay. Mr. Wynn. I, I agree with, with, with your assessment on this is a bad habit or an accident. I'd like to give him the benefit of the doubt, but you know, your last statement, Director, is um, th this is sensitive, obviously, and to correct or amend a piece of evidence that you're giving to someone in the middle of a criminal investigation, excuse me, an oversight investigation. My mind goes to court because what I'm thinking, I judge might be thinking the same thing, that all of this would be thrown out in a criminal case because the evidence has been altered. That happens when well, we're not a court. I got that. But I agree that we'd like to know, or I would like to know, who uh, instructed this person to alter the body-worn camera footage um, and have an explanation from them and, and what, the, what the motive was and what the reason was. Could be some legitimate reason, but I can't imagine one. <laughs> so th this is just common sense. This is, this, this is not good. I'm not good. Thank you. Dr. Hildred. Thank you. Following from uh, the members' comments, I'm just wondering about supervisor liability. I'm very interested, and this actually came up before with, with other matters that we've been thinking about, and Member Milner is, is good at pointing out what he perceives to be patterns of practice. Um, is there a point where something that seems to be an egregious process violation, um, we hope there's not a pattern, but if there is, does this then open up the venue for directors' complaints and investigations that rest at the level of the supervisor? I'm just wondering. Thank you. Mr. Holloway. It's, 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 it's kind of good in the sense that this did happen. This is nothing new. I'm a victim myself of it. And the person who altered that should be terminated. And I hope that's a way they can find out that, you know, because if it did it one time, they'd do it again. And you need to set a presence. I know it can be done. I'm a victim of it. Mr. Milner. Mr. Chair, I have yet to hear anything so egregious in my time here. Uh, I, I just want to be sure that uh, I just have a question for the director. What, what was the audio or the video or both spliced? Well, we, we only have the video. Okay, okay so. And so, you know, because I watched it multiple times, everyone in the office who's involved with this watched it multiple times. So when I got this in the record, that there was this profanity. I remember the conversation with the complainant, but it didn't have profanity. Mm -hmm. It's the similar words, almost exactly, except for the F. So it was right? dubbed or was it? No, no, no. Okay. So they're right before they're having a conversation, and then shortly thereafter, they're at the counter where you check out, and that is where this profanity is alleged to have happened. Okay. All right. Uh, and there's no doubt about that. Well, that's, I haven't seen that video. We're, we requested to see the one with the profanity mm -hmm. in it. Okay. We haven't received it as of yet. Uh, Mr. Chair, I, 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 I want to know who, and I want to know if it was and why, 
And I, I would like to think that this warrants a serious investigation because it's basically tampering with evidence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that is an offense that, that, that should be reckoned with. Okay, so I, I'm just in awe. I don't want to say anything more, but who and why? And I also think that we have to address the fact that if, if it was brought up as a concern to the, the OPA investigator, I still don't understand in the response from the chief why it wasn't addressed in his response to us. Mm -hmm. Where he said, you know, where they say this is a category J offense, yeah. Yeah. it should be sustained right. that there was profanity, right. but in his response, there isn't any, it, it doesn't, it just goes on about bias. It goes about the specifics that we address and not whether or not the OPA, you know, um, disciplined the offer as, as they could have um, because that was something separate than what we had initially thought was going on. Okay, uh, Ms. Spencer. I would like to start off by just saying how absurd this all seems. This is absolutely absurd. And I want to again reference what I was talking about with trust and transparency. This is a clear matter where that trust and transparency has been explicitly just degraded. I, and I just am still in awe of how, of how it's happened like this. I mean, if, even for one thing, like I feel like this calls into, into question all of their internal practices as a department, because how can something so egregious where for an oversight body to not be receiving the necessary unredacted materials as is, as is stated by the MOU, as, as, we, as is our right, basically, as I would interpret and say, like that, that's been allowed to, to happen. And so then, like, if it's happened in this instance and we just caught it, just because there was, again, this conflict between what um, this investigator is saying and then what the chief's response is. Because I also found it very interesting in the chief's response that the consequences for this officer were deemed to be even more severe, if I remember reading that correctly. And yet, this isn't referenced in it. But yet this is also something that they flag. So there's clearly something that's not adding up. The math does not add up to me. And it's very, very concerning for me. Um, and again, I just think that this really calls into a lot around internal process because I don't know how this, is, how this happened. And then at the same time, we don't know how long this has happened, if it's happened before. And then how are we supposed to get the actual investigation done on the rep? on the rest of like the recordings. Because then who's basically going over those? You know, is there even more that we just don't know? And then really, um, I also, this also, I think there's so many things that we have talked about today in the full context of them, thinking about the implicit bias training and the rejection of that by the chief, saying that all officers do take that implicit bias training, then bringing up the incident at a recruiting event, we have four white male officers basically like sitting at like a like a little booth with like images of like black men around like gang paraphernalia, around cannabis for some reason in a jar, which honestly still makes no sense to me, at a whole recruitment event and not seeing that there's any sort of racial overtones, and yet there's no reason, like in this officer's case, that as we were saying, that there was need for bias training. Mm -hmm. And it feels like the logic then stems from, well, there's no evidence of that bias based on this footage that now, for all we know, could be compromised. Mm -hmm. And yet, so we don't need any more bias training. And so it really, the thorough line through all of this really dramatically concerns me because if we had not if you had not caught that then we would have moved on and we would have thought of x y and z else instead of this clear issue within their own system um and again it all just seems to kind of lay out into that it really feels like in my understanding and i'm also a little overwhelmed, as I assume most of the board members are, just by how egregious this is. But that we, there has to be 
a lot of critical conversations around where this trust and transparency is able to come from from the police department. Because at this point, you know, for the rest of the community to unlearn this and understand about it, it ruins a lot of work that's been done. Because how are people supposed to believe that you know you're just supposed to be protected as as is being stated when this is also happening? So I'll leave it my comments at that right now. In my comments, I do want to add that I'm I'm really you know pleased that you know we do have a, a staff that's detailed enough where they they caught something like this. I mean we're fortunate with that. I can see where that would go over you know a, a number of uh, individuals' head. Uh, but yeah, it does call into question. You know, are there others? situations like this where we haven't been given the proper information. And um, I guess, you know, I guess where we're at is, you know, uh, Director Fitchard is, is, is waiting for a response, you know, from the chief. And I guess that's where we're at. I think that's the, that's the step. But I thought I heard some other items that we probably need to convey also with that. But, but if it's you are uncomfortable with Director Fritchard, you know, following up, you know, with this. Okay. Uh, I think uh, Director was first and then uh, Mr. Milner. Um, I did want to make a and correction. And then uh, Mr. Wynn. So they, they did uh, sustain the violation of, of the um, profanity um, that we didn't know about. Mm -hmm. um, so they, it says office, the officer conducted himself in an unprofessional manner, um, unnecessarily argued with the complainant, grew frustrated with all the persons involved, um, and then used a, and cursed. And they sustained it. Um, and then what the chief says is, um, I agree that the conclusion that the officer violated policy in this manner. Um, it says, uh, the, it says, violated policy in this matter. The board found that the officer was guilty of conduct unbecoming and discourtesy, which is a category of violation, which is what I just looked up. It is. Um, and it says that they recommended sanction. The recommended sanction was a formal counseling and additional training. Um, and it says, I, while I agree that the officer violated policy, I concur with OPA's findings that, that the violations are more serious than the board found. Mm. We didn't even know about it, so of course it was more serious, you know. But anyway, I just wanted to bring that up and make a correction that there was a sanction for that, so. Okay, Mr. Milner. Mr. Milner and then Mr. Wynn. We sit here with immense authority from a charter amendment of the people. We are now discussing evidence that has been tampered with, that has been sent to us via the MMPD system. I just want you to think about what does the average person, the average citizen who is faced with this type of, of, of process, of evidence, what chance do they have? In getting, we stand in the gap right now, right now. And I would like to just get an answer to a question. Is this something that TBI can be, we could refer to TBI? Is this something we could refer to DOJ? Because certainly waiting for an internal investigation, it's not going to, uh, I'm not going to have any confidence in it. So my question is, is this an instance where this could be referred to the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation or other third party. And I would yield to uh, either Attorney Alex Dickerson or uh, Director Fitchard on that. Um, I, this is obviously an awkward position. Um, I, I will say that the board can take any action with respect to writing to uh, endorsing letters things of that nature, so you can endorse um, a communication of any sort. There's no limitations on your ability to do that. But I, I'm, I'm not familiar at all with re recommendations of issues to the TBI or other DOJ. Um, but as far as your authority, you can do that. 
I will say that, in my opinion, what I see, ha what I saw happening here, and I don't know if all the others, that's why I think getting this letter back, uh, res a response from them and having it cataloged and outlined would be helpful because from just at the top of my head, it sounds like obstruction. Um, but, in, but until we get all of the information from um, the other parties that what we requested, um, I think we should probably yield until we get that letter back. I would hope that listening to this conversation, they would be, you know, move expeditiously on this um, because it is egregious. I don't know if all of the cases, which makes me now have to rethink what we're looking at, you know, I'm going to have to get some special glasses. I mean, because the splice is so, just so perfect. You would barely, you, I mean, I watched it. It, I mean, I would have spent at least four hours, five hours watching this video because it's one hour, the entirety of the of the of the um, video footage. And if I didn't know it was at twenty point fifty four, to start looking for it, I would have never seen it. Mr. Wayne, were you next? Yeah, I had one question for the director. When when evidence is given to you to view. Is there a process where the person responsible for that evidence says to you, here's the video footage of ABC, and my name is Officer Smith, and I'm responsible for this evidence, and it's unaltered, and it's, it's what we have, hadn't been tampered with, hadn't been altered, this is the raw footage. Does that happen with you and the people? With the no, when we, how this works is our investigators request the information directly from the records department. Right, and the records department, whoever they have employed there, I can't remember the, the woman's name, she, you know, gets that information. I don't know where she obtains it from, but it's given to her. I'm sure it's downloaded from someone who is operating with the body worn cameras. There is a person over the body worn camera, um, there is a, a captain, um, but I don't know if he is the person that is delivering the information directly to the records department. Um, the rec a lot of the records that I get um, from directly from Commander Laura, those are involved with, um, you know, or the TBI files. Those are separately from what, what we're requesting. Those go into a different file. Right. These are requested through the regular uh, records division of the police department. So I don't know who's touching them and where they're going. But I, I do I, I do have a lot of concern because we have lots of cases, um, and which makes it going to be even more yeah, unless until we get that catalog to know if there's been redactions, I mean, I, I, we're going to have to spend a lot of time trying to l just look at it closely. Um, and, and what really is concerning is that there could be other, you well, know. And um, a follow up, just real quick yeah. to that. Um, and we don't know yet until Chief Drake right. tells us what he's found out in this case. But. What would be wrong with the board designing some sort of um, evidence transfer form that says, I, Investigator Jones, are allowing you or your investigators to view it. To my knowledge, this is unaltered. Have them sign it and date it for our records. Uh, that would seem to be a, a way of uh, protecting the chain of evidence from the police to the board. Right. I mean, it's not a guarantee. Anybody can alter anything right. uh, if, you're, if you have your hands on it. But to have them sign off and say, and you hate for this to have to happen, but if it's true, then, you know, uh, I'm, you know I'm trust but verify territory now. I believe Dr. Hildreth, I think I saw yours, then Mr. Abdullah, then Judge Brown, I believe I saw you. Wait. Okay, you weren't waving. Okay. Thank you. Just following the chain of discussion um, and very good process recommendations, I am interested in us as a board um, waiting to hear the response that Director Fitcher receives from this inquiry to see where we are. Um, I am interested during the interim of this next month to answer some of Member Milner's questions about what does a referral to TBI look like and what could there be reasonable expectations? I'm very interested in the DOJ, specifically with the conciliation service, 
that representative of that office, I think, is in Atlanta. And they do work, and they've done work in this jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. I believe it was after Jacques Clements, when, 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 when this board was Correct. in pendency, we right? A, we have a contact, Mr. Atkins. Mr. Atkins, right, who has come up multi-days and interviewed different individuals and constituencies in the city and that office has a very good reputation of moving in quietly and fairly and working with different units in a community to come up with a report that not everybody agrees on but may have some semblance of being you know an outside verification as opposed to our own um, since so just to even think about that and then a third question I just had and maybe it won't rise to this but I do remember very early on and this is where <laughs> oh my gosh um, having been on this board a long time Gerald Funk yeah. did come before this board and I seem to remember in the room and it must have been pre-COVID so we're talking about 2019 or earlier um, bringing senior leadership of his staff uh, expressing support for our work and a willingness to help us at any time to come forward with information. It might be interesting if we continue to have concerns. Mm -hmm. Again, more so with respect to pattern and practice. One-offs can happen. Mm -hmm. But if we have the slightest concern, there's a potential pattern here. Would it be something that the board would like to do would be to invite General Funk to come give us an informational or give us dialogue about what that looks like. So those those are just the, um, the punch list of possibilities that I wanted to lay out for work that may be able to proceed over the next month while we are waiting to learn a little more closely what may or may not have happened in this case. And I will say Amendment 1 says, I mean, we can go back to that. It says, you know, we have the option of forwarding resolution reports that produce factual findings of criminal misconduct and civil rights violations to the DA, the grand jury, or the United States Attorney. I don't know if this rises to a civil rights violation. I think there is some type of violation here if we find out that there is a pattern and a practice of this behavior. Um, and so that, you know, I don't, and I agree with him, uh, with Mr. Dickerson, that, um, you know, we can send a letter to anyone. So we can invite Mr. Atkins. I mean, there's a host of things, but I think we do have to wait right. to see right. what is happening. We have to wait. Like, yes. And let me clarify my recommendation with respect to Mr. Atkins in that office. I yeah. was thinking more about information, not contacting them yet, okay. but having a presentation to the board of what that right. possibility okay. is, mm -hmm. and maybe even having Metro Human Relations Commission Executive Director come talk a little bit about what that process has looked like in the past. Mm -hmm. I was making a recommendation to possibly hold open an invitation to General Funk to speak around generalities. Mm -hmm. My recommendation did not rise to the level Right. of filing a complaint yeah, understood. with the district attorney, right. but just to take him and his office up on the offer of, say, three years ago mm -hmm. of being a thought partner mm -hmm. in this mm -hmm. process mm -hmm. on the gotcha. record. Understood. And we also have the option of, you know, establishing more, um, if we have, an, an, since we have some additional in, uh, employees coming, to do a, more of an auditing and monitoring um, of body-worn camera footage. I think that's going to be important as well um, as we move forward. Mr. Abdullah? Yeah, I just want to kind of echo what Mr. Wynn said, but before I do that, it feels like, that we have, we are constantly dodging and battling a police department that does not really want to give the information, you know, and, and, and I could be wrong, but that's the feeling that I'm getting. Ever since I've been here for the past, uh, since September of 21, it feels like we were, we were just constantly uh, trying to get information. And when you look at it over a period of time, things can drag out for so long that we it's almost like we become used to not getting the information. And so I, I'm, you know, I, I was sitting there listening to Mr. Wynn, 
and he mentioned maybe something in writing. But when we ask for information, we should, you know, should we have to even ask for the redacted, you know, uh, and I don't know if I'm using it correctly, but uh, unredacted mm -hmm. form. But if that's the case, then maybe we should begin asking, can we get all of the information and, and again, like he mentioned, make them sign off on us getting full information. Because in the mean, it, it seems like if if they do one thing, there's, there's going to be something else over here, you know. Or, and there's always something. And I really feel as if the people of this city just have no idea as to what's happening, what's going on. So. Should we get the district attorney involved or should we call them? I believe so. But there has to be something that we can do to make people begin to move and, and begin to really kind of respect this body. I feel like this body is not getting the respect from the city. It doesn't get the respect from the Metro Police Department. We have to begin to do something to make the people make people in government uh, in the overall government respect this body, and so, you know, I just want to I just want to kind of say that because every time, every week, or every month, we come and we have the same conversations. There's the police, the police department is not giving us full information, or you know, there's something where we don't have it. You know, we don't have any bite in what we're doing because of information that's too old or it's just it seems to me that this is always something there's always some kind of something involved and so i just feel like you know we should maybe have it where we ask for complete information up front and if we don't get that now we know okay we didn't get that even though it's a part of the MOU, even though we asked for it in, uh, in writing, we're still not getting it. And then we can present to the district attorney. Then we can present to the public showing that we've been asking, and now, you know, this is this is what you need to see. So that's all I have. Okay, Mr. Holloway, and I'm just going to remind everyone, it's a quarter till eight. Uh, Mr. Holloway. I'll make it brief. Um, if uh, Director Fitcher doesn't get the information that she needed by the next meeting, my thing is to put it in the newspaper, put this case in the newspaper, expose it, and let the people know what's going on. And I guarantee you we'll get some results from there. Ms. Spencer. I agree with the sentiment, but I would shorten that time frame. This is egregious, even if this is a mistake, like there was just a one-off. And again, we all are recognizing that mistakes can happen, but the level of severity of this mistake warrants immediate action, immediate action. We cannot walk away from what has happened here having done nothing. Something has to happen, and I would, I would shorten that time frame to honestly being generous two weeks at most, because I think that really, honestly, it should be within the next, probably about the next, at least within a week, with 24 hours, that, let's go for that. I, I would go for that because we need a response on this immediately. Because again, as multiple of my colleagues have mentioned, this causes us to question a whole range of other cases. And again, as like I perhaps, I don't know if, if I did it well enough, but like just the thorough line of what the response is from the police department around, again, you know, the, an officer's actions were even more severe, but then where is is uh, kind of evidence, and then that's not being shown, but then there's a accusations of bias, and that's being pu pushed back against. And yet, at the same time, we have this kind of back and forth, like, oh, we're seeing things in the community, again, bring up the whole recruitment activity, where it's clear that there is that kind of bias being present. I would really fully state that that is evidence of that kind of bias. When you have, when you're not even aware of the blatant racial overtone, overtones, and yet you're supposed to be recruiting more black, black and brown folks into the police department. It does not make sense to me. The conclusions that have been pushed back from the police department, and also now seeing that there has been potentially this tampering of evidence before we can even see it. Honestly, it makes me feel like what would really be helpful is if we could, uh, MNCO staff could get the same body footage, body worn camera footage immediately. I would rather just, it should go immediately to investigators if somehow possible, because that just, to me, to me, I just can't, 
I'm trying to fathom and like really grapple with the kind of response to something like this because it's just, it's terrifying almost because then like at what other points that has this happened? And we just don't know. And that, I know that gives so many people so much fear. Um, and so I really, I really do want to lean into the sentiment and really I would, I would motion to almost to basically give them 24 hours before. And like perhaps that might be really expedient depending on some folks. Um, I know some folks are feeling right now, and I also do see the necessity in like tr really giving time for a response. But I just think that we cannot wait, wait very long for a response on this. I mean, I just think about you know for people walking down the street, if something if something happened, and that we're not even getting the evidence, the full unredacted evidence, even even if it's just even if it's just like ten seconds. That's not the whole picture. Yeah. We're not being given the whole picture. And it just does not, it does not make, make sense and it does not sit well with me at all. And I want to add that, you know, what happens, so just so that you understand process, they ask for, once we give the PRR, we send it to the chief, then the investigator asked us for our entire file. They say, send us everything that you had, that you made this decision. Which means that I sent this entire file, or the investigator sent the entire file with the, the body-worn camera footage, with all of the reports, any type of uh, witness interviews or things that they would not have. And they have an opportunity to review the information that we have in our file. So I'm not sure why they did not catch when they reviewed the file that there was a complete video that was not the same as the video that they are looking at when they are creating their own OPA investigation. I just don't understand it. Uh, okay, Judge, Judge Brown was next. Sorry, and if Okay, I go just, ahead and finish. Though. Oh, my bad, my bad. No, go, I was gonna say, go ahead and finish. Okay, sorry, uh -huh. apologies. Um, and, uh, and also really, really, and again, perhaps this is not necessarily even like a fair thought to fully to fully give, but it just the circumstance. Sometimes it just it just feels like so much of like this full context that we're viewing right now is just really this weird, like very rare alignment of just like the grievances. Again, it just does not. It doesn't dawn on me that, you know, again, this, the actions were supposed to be more severe in a case where we really explicitly outlined that we did feel like racial bias was needed and that that needed to be addressed. And yet, when we start looking more and more into, like, even the evidence of it, there's an example of it potentially being redacted and being obstructed from us. It just... A lot of that just does not sit right with me. And again, I understand that, you know, they... And I will agree that we do need to hear a response. But I'm also really, really trying to grapple with how heavy this response can actually be to such an egregious error. Sorry. Judge Brown. Well, I'm a little concerned that we're jumping to a lot of conclusions here without facts. And I like facts before I reach a conclusion and we've asked for an explanation on this and uh, it's not going to get done in 24 hours and, and we've got meetings coming up I think we need to take a look at it um, it obviously uh, if what uh, if something has been redacted before we get it uh, we need to find out what's going on I'd point out though that in this case the uh, the chief uh, apparently had the profanity and took took more action than than we recommended. So this if the if the police department was trying to cover something up, uh, uh, it it didn't that wasn't the result. The chief had it and, and in fact recommended something more than we did. Now we need to find out why there's a difference, but I think we're we're jumping to conclusions that you know there's. That this is some nefarious thing, and the police is uh, wrong on it. I think we need to get some more facts before we we start jumping to conclusions and putting stuff in the paper. 
uh, and I, we're going to we've asked for an explanation, and I think we need to see what that explanation is, uh, and then take some action uh, as appropriate. But I, th I think we're getting I think we're getting our cart way ahead of our horse right now. Anyone else? Mr. Miller. Uh, yeah, I, I totally agree with Judge Brown on it, and I, I, I certainly am emphatic about it, uh, but I, I want to make the record clear uh, that pending the response that we get back, those options that I discussed, they're not going to go away. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Mr. Holloway. Uh, I just want to be clear to Judge Brown. I did say if she didn't receive the proper information by next month, right. then go to the paper. I'm not saying put it in the paper without evidence. I believe in the facts, and uh, I call the order of the agenda. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Anyone else? Okay. Next item. So it says, in anticipation of the upcoming chair vacancy, which is expected to take effect on August the 4th, 2022, the nominating committee decided on the attached schedule and deadlines, which sets out a deadline by which nominations for chair are to be received from board members. Eligibility criteria of nominees considered and a special election for chair is to be held on August the 24th, 2022, during the general board meeting as an agenda item. Um, and then it goes on to talk about the, the rules and the bylaws in regards to that. Um, it says the chair, I'll read this section. Um, the bylaws um, says, including, uh, it talks about, it says the bylaws list non-exhaustive criteria for all officers, including the chair. A, interest in serving on the executive committee. B, attendance at board meetings and functions. C, participation in the mission of the board. And D, responsiveness to the staff of the board. Article 7, Section 2A states, the chair shall preside at all meetings of the board and executive committee. The chair shall be responsible for the general administration of the board's affairs, general supervision of the board's staff, and the implementation of the board's recommendations, resolutions, and policies. The chair shall have, hold, and exercise such powers and perform such duties as provided for in the COB bylaws or by the executive committee. The chair will serve out the remainder of the current chair's one-year term and traditionally has been a board member representing either a community group or a council nominated not a mayor-nominated board member. So that is the notice. Um, the special election for the chair schedule, Wednesday, June 22nd, 2022. Um, this is the actual general board meeting by which time we would do the report. Um, and this notice of special election of the chair will be sent out to all board members in advance. Wednesday, July the 3rd, 2022, the deadline by which chair nominations are to be received. So board members may send their nominations for chair, including self-nominations, to MNCO staff or any member of the nominating committee. Those nominees will be considered along with other relevant candidate criteria at the August meeting of the nominating committee. The nominating committee will present eligible nominees or a nominee at the special election of the chair during the August 24th, 2022 board meeting. Wednesday, August, August the 10th, 2022, the nominating committee meeting where they will consider the relevant candidate criteria of all the chair nominees. Wednesday, August the 24th, 2022, the general board at the general board meeting at which a special election of the chair will be on the agenda. Board members will vote on the chair nominee or nominees and a majority vote of members present will pass. And here's a report from the committee. 
The members of the nominating committee met on Wednesday, June 15th, 2022, immediately following the executive committee meeting. Except the executive committee, a quorum is not required for committee or task force meetings and decision making. However, all members of the nominating committee were in attendance, as well as board chair Arnold Hayes, executive director Jill Fitchard, community liaison D'Amica Robinson, research analyst Gavin Crow Williamson, and legal resource advisor Daniel Yoon. At this inaugural meeting, it was acknowledged that this meeting complied with Article 8, Section 4 of the bylaws, which states the nominating committee will recommend board members for the officer roles. The nominating committee shall be appointed by the chair of the board and shall begin its deliberations by June 22nd of each calendar year. The nominating committee discussed the upcoming chair vacancy, which is expected to take effect on August the 4th, 2022. In anticipation of that vacancy, the executive committee asked the nominating committee to begin the process of holding a special election of the board to recommend board members for that officer position. The next general board meeting following the chair's vacancy is expected to be August the 24th, 2022. The nominating committee discussed the relevant candidate eligibility for board members as officers, as well as the non-exclusive -ex list of criteria provided in Article 8, Section 4 of the bylaws, which lists what I just said, which is interest in serving on the executive committee, attendance at board meetings and functions, participation in the mission of the board, and responsiveness to the staff of the board. And then it goes on to say the dates that I just, um, that I just mentioned. So is there any questions about that? I also sent this to each one of you. So if you forget the dates and times, you have that as a reminder, or you can always email myself or Daniel Yoon. So. Okay, I think we're at, are there any other new business or announcements? I do have one um, announcement. Um, I forgot to put on this um, director's report that the panel that for NACO, the, uh, our panel was accepted. And so I will be one of the speakers at this year's conference. So mm -hmm. thank you. I'll give you more information once I have it. Thank you all, appreciate it. Okay, we're just about done, but I, I do want to just thank this board for all the hard work and sacrifices. This has been a long time, but this was, we needed to discuss this issue. We need to, so thank you all. And, and again, uh, Attorney Alex uh, Dickerson, thank you for uh, standing in for Attorney Yoon. And so we're now at uh, adjournment. I will entertain a motion. So moved. A second. second. Okay. <laughs> We're adjourned, and it is what time? It's oh, seven fifty nine. <laughs> <laughs>